Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to the 18th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody switch off their electronic devices or at least switch them to silent mode so it doesn't interfere with the work of the committee? Um, agenda item one is for the committee to take items five, six, seven in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Item two is Edinburgh College, um, and we'll take evidence on the Auditor General's 2015-16 audit of Edinburgh College. And I welcome from the college Annette Bruton, who's the Principal and Chief Executive, Alan Williamson, the Chief Operating Officer, and Ian Mackay, Chair of the Board. Um, could I invite an opening statement from Mr Mackay? Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you to the Committee for your continued and considered work in this area. Edinburgh College, I think, like many colleges in further education sectors, experienced considerable change over the last few years, and our college has been through challenging times, as you know. It's exemplified in what we're discussing here today, and indeed those challenges remain going forward, uh, most recently highlighted by the potential cost of the meeting the national uh, pay bargaining uh, settlement. Uh, the originating matter that was brought to the attention of this committee was the mistaken use of additionality within courses in the college and the knock-on effect of the resulting clawback by the SFC of £800,000 uh, to the college's final accounts that year. Uh, this matter has been fully reported to the board and our response as a college has involved the board and myself directly. That response to the original Section 22 report and the related work by the executive and boards has been helpful to the College in allowing a forensic examination of our processes and our procedures and resulted in considerable improvement there. We've reduced the size of the College and tailored courses to better reflect the needs of our wider community. We've removed underperforming courses and we've successfully refocused our offering such that this year We've met our SFC targets in overall credits, in higher education credits, and in EU additional credits. The board of the college has sought throughout the process to offer both challenge and support to the executive, and we're pleased to see that that process is beginning to bear fruit. We've sought to be transparent about all of these things from the start. We've worked with the Scottish Funding Council We've agreed financial assistance with them and we've created a business transformation plan. This plan has taken the college forward and has provided, I think, myself and the board with the confidence that we need to go forward. Most importantly, I think has been a result of all that work. Two years on, with much better information coming to the board and the committees, the principal has reshaped the senior management team We've met our credit targets for the first time, as I say, since merger. Our financial recovery plan is working, and perhaps most importantly for me, our award-winning students are registering improved rates of attainment and high rates of satisfaction. I think, Chair, we still have some way to go on the road to recovery and to growth, but I believe it's the helpful reports from the Auditor General and your own work and our own internal processes have shown that we're now on much more solid ground uh, than we had before, and I hope that we have every chance of reaching our goals successfully. Thank you for the time to make the statement. Thank you very much, Mr Mackay. We'll now turn to questions from members. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, in the written submission from EIS, there's a number of allegations made here in terms of how the, the, the college uh, functions. Uh, you're probably aware of this. What, what would you, your response to this be? I became aware of it when I saw your uh, papers that were published. Uh, I wasn't aware of it before, uh, but I think possibly the uh, principal would uh, be in a better position to answer the specifics of the allegations that are there. Through you two, thank you very much. Um, I too saw it um, in the committee pack. It hadn't been drawn to my attention uh, prior to uh, the papers being submitted for this committee. <laughs> first time that you're aware of these allegations? It's the first time I've seen these allegations uh, drawn to my attention in this way. They haven't been drawn to my attention uh, before I saw them in that committee pack. There are ongoing discussion with teachers' unions about some of these matters in terms of policy, but I've never seen these allegations before. 
Would you have a response to yes, that? Yes, I would. Um, I don't know if the committee want me to uh, go into all of the areas that were raised in that communication. It would be helpful if okay. you could do so. Okay, so uh, there are a number of things I'd like to clarify about the, the various matters that were raised in that um, communication to the committee. Um, first of all, in terms of credits and additionality, there are no national standards with regards to credits. I think the committee's had that discussion with the Auditor General in the past. Uh, the credits are agreed by the Scottish Funding Council with every college as part of the Regional Outcome Agreement. All of that is within an agreed maximum target of 2.5% available of total credits for additionality. That's the current uh, rules. They change from time to time, but at the moment it's 2.5%. Um, Edinburgh College is no different from any other college in that respect. However, because of what we've been through in the past, we've actually held down the number of additional credits that we have been making use of. And we are actually maintaining a below at sector average at the point of me looking at the credits last week of 1%. Um, this has been reported to the SFC at regular bi-monthly meetings, which as a committee is aware we're having as a part of the transformation plan. The Funding Council have indicated that they're pleased with the college's progress and that the college is well under um, the 2.5% national target. With regard to our credit targets for this year, as the chair has just said, we actually have not only uh, met our credit targets, but that's reflected in real students. So last year, uh, in 2015-16, we enrolled 18,541 unique students. And this year, we have enrolled 19,318 unique students. So the committee can see that the increase in the credits is actually down to additional students coming to the college. Um, with regard to remarks that have been made about the EC units, it's quite a technical area of work, and I'm happy to explain in detail to the committee or write the committee uh, in more detail if you wish. But just to kind of put the EC units in context, um, there are various types of credits that we can claim for as part of the funding package for all colleges. These include SA, um, SQA units, they include uh, the kind of learning that students do if they're doing city and guilds. They include the kind of courses that students are on on a bridge project to higher education. And the EC units are part of that overall package which recognises the amount of learning that students do in addition to the qualifications they get. So if I give you an example of that, for example, a student studying National 5 in French in the college um, that's a four credit course, so we can claim the four credits for the two units that are in it. But in addition, we're able to claim an additional credit because we're preparing the students for their exams and they're actually sitting the exams. So that's an example of where uh, EC credits would be used. The, um, the, n the, the general volume of EC credits is agreed as part of our funding agreement with the Scottish Funding Council and is published in our uh, uh, regional outcome agreement. So that's built in at the point of the overall planning for the course of study. In terms of withdrawing students, um, our policy hasn't changed this year in terms of withdrawing students. We, ha we have made some changes to the arrangements that we've made in year in withdrawing students. So one of the problems that we had, and this committee I think asked me about that the last time we were here, or we put it in our evidence for the committee, was that in, um, in former years, our students were able to be withdrawn by the lecturers uh, simply because they'd stopped turning up for class. And one of the improvements that we've introduced this year is that it's necessary before any student can be withdrawn from a course that they've been followed up by the manager in charge of that area, student support services or our finance team. Because the reasons that students drop out of class are mainly for financial reasons, for health reasons, for mental health reasons or for personal reasons. So one of the things that we think is important, uh, uh, unrelated to credits, is that we give every student every chance to rejoin that course. Now that's really important, it's one of the things that we're looking at nationally in FE. So we've made some inroads into that this year, and we've been much more successful in retaining our students than we have done in previous years. Later this morning, uh, you're going to be seeing a report from the Auditor General on the further education sector 2017. And in her report, the Auditor General, uh, in section 25, uh, publishes the retention rates for full-time students 
um, and part-time students in Scotland. Compared with those figures for the period 15-16, we're pleased to be able to report that in 16-17, Edinburgh College has not only improved its performance against all of those measures, but we've actually done better than the national average as it was last year. And that's down to actually making sure that the most vulnerable students, those most likely to drop out of Edinburgh College, are given every chance to get back into their course and supported to do so. The final point I would like to make, and I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time, but you did ask me to... Um, yeah, yeah. The issues, and you've addressed the issues in the submission. I'm going to let Colin Beattie come okay. back in. There will be other questions that I'm sure will Thank allow you, you to give us Thank that you. information. Convener, uh, uh, I've, I've heard what the principal said there. Uh, the submission from EIS indicates that they can provide documentary evidence, I think, relating to withdrawals. Uh, could we write to EIS and ask them for this documentary evidence? Yes, I'm sure the committee could. Yes. Uh, I'd like to turn to governance. The board, which in this case in, in Edinburgh College seems to have been taking a bit of a back seat, I would say. I mean, according to what we have here, uh, the board, as far back as 2013-14, realised that there was a problem with the financial information coming forward mm -hmm. and discussed how they could develop better management information. Uh, but it doesn't seem anything ha happened about that. Why? Um, I think that one would fall to me, Colin, and I think what you'll also see in the reports from uh, Carolyn Gardner and her team and from the minutes of the board meetings at that time, I noted your points uh, in the previous hearing, I think what you will see is that far from uh, not doing anything about it or not being active on it, actually the board had that almost as a standing item at every meeting that we had. Uh, we pursued vigorously what we saw as an ongoing issue that we never seem to be getting answers to. Uh, not unlike yourselves, there's a tendency, I think, when you come up against a financial issue, when I mean, you're a member of a board, to follow the money and to you know, go for, have a look at your financial systems and so on. Uh, and that's what we did in the first place. And you'll see from the board minutes, and I think it's, it's reported in section 28 of the 1516 uh, audit, uh, that we were asking you know, a number of questions and trying to pursue uh, those issues that you've raised. Um, I think what became, it only became clear later that although this was presenting, obviously, as a, a financial difficulty, the real cause lay in the, on the curricular side, and it lay, if you like, on the supply side of the equation, where we were simply not getting enough bums on seats, enough income coming in through our courses. Now, uh, I would put my hands up and say we pursued the financials first. It was only once we had found that really that wasn't giving us the answers that the, that the board started to look in other directions. And it was also, as I said in my opening statement, the happen chance almost of the 800k clawback and that pointing us in the direction of looking at the curricular side much more vigorously and the work that the new incoming principal then did that allowed us to actually finally get to the bottom of where the, where the real problem lay. But to say that the board was not you know, uh, concerned in that and doing things about that, I'm afraid I, I would have to challenge that. And I think if you look at our minutes, you will see that, in fact, we were challenging that all the way through. If we look at the period when the board first became aware that there was a problem with financial information and also with uh, um, management information, which is a bit broader, how long did it take before the board actually managed to receive information which was uh, useful and which they were able to act on? I think that the, the most useful uh, breakthrough was in, a, in the uh, examination that the new principal did uh, as a result of the uh, additionality. I mean, her, you know, the discussion that we had had, it set uh, the principal down the road of looking at, at why you know, people had claimed th these additional things when they, when they shouldn't have been claiming as much as they had. But, from but where memory. that took us was, the, was that, in fact, there were underlying issues there. Yeah. So once we got there, it didn't take us very long at all. But getting there, we looked mostly at the financial processes. But I think the principal's review, if I remember correctly, was 2015? It, it was at the beginning of 2015, that's right. End of 2015. Yep. So there's a couple of years here as far as I can see, 
that the board was wrestling with these problems, and that seems an awful long time. Yep. It's less than a couple of years, and I think what the other th points again, you know, and realise that in these reports you'll tend to get only the matter that's under discussion. What you don't get is a wider context. The other thing you've got to remember there is we had also parted company with the then principal. We had brought in an interim principal. We had actually started a recovery plan with the SFC to address the financial issues that we saw there. And in fact, that was going reasonably successfully at the time. It still hadn't, in fact, taken us to the final conclusion of where, in fact, these, these uh, problems were originating from. But I can say to you that when we appointed the interim principal, which was, uh, I'm just trying to get my memory right, in 14, when the interim principal came in before Annette took up office for about six months, that was a very experienced principal from the South who had dealt uh, with uh, interim uh, principal positions in the past. She was uh, recommended to me by the chief executive of the SFC and I appointed her. And my first uh, instruction to her was, I want you to look at the whole financial side of this college. I want you to open every cupboard. I want to find every skeleton. I want to find out if our processes are right. And she came back to me after having investigated that and said, as far as she could see, everything was sound. So it was not that we were, you know, sitting on our hands there, but we were, I think, first of all, making sure that we were absolutely secure that our financial side and our financial processes were sound. It was only, as I say, once we started to redirect that, you know, that not having given us the answers, that we then moved on to the... Uh, the curricular side in particular after the next report. So uh, It seems that for any board, I, I take on board what you say, I understand that uh, you know, these things take time, that, that you know, it, it was a difficult situation. But as a board, if you're not getting financial information, if you're not getting management information, don't you do something about it in less than a couple of years? I mean, you, you say that you didn't get adequate information on the the crisis that was facing Edinburgh College until the principal did her review. That 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 was an awful long time. No, what I said was that we didn't start to understand what the what the real underlying uh, problem was until that that review was carried out. What we had done was pursue the problem that was there in the reports that we were getting and seek to get to the bottom of that and to make ourselves very secure that, in fact, the financial processes in the college were sound and were working properly. Now, knowing that you have an outcome in a financial side does not mean that the cause is necessarily on the financial side, and that's what we have, we have found in this case. Again, I think if you look at the Auditor General's reports, you will see on a number of occasions, they're making the point that the board did pursue this vigorously with executives. We did challenge them and we did ask them. Every time we got an answer and we came to the next board meeting and it clearly hadn't corrected it, we went back and asked again and tried to pursue uh, into other areas. That, I'm afraid, is, you know, at the end of the day, a board is not in a position to simply you know, walk into the executive's office and start doing their job for them. What they have to do, however, and you're quite right, you know, to pursue this line of inquiry, we did what we period. had to do in pursuing the executives to make sure they were doing the but job. If right over through. a period of many months you're asking the questions and not getting the answers, as a board, don't you take action? Can I again refer you back to the Auditor General's reports? And what you'll see there is we were getting answers, but the answers themselves were not actually addressing the problems that, that we were asking about. But you and it was that. only then that, you know, the, you're still getting an answer, yeah. but you've then got to go back in and pursue again and try and go deeper or try and go wider in order to get that answer. We pursued that. We were not perfect, and I'll be the first to say we were not yeah. perfect, but we did, in fact, seek to pursue and seek to get the answers, because we, like you, realised there was an ongoing problem that was not being solved by the answers we were getting from the executives. In the end, that also saw a wholesale change in the executives themselves, which I think is the inevitable end of such a process. Okay. Willie Coffey, you wanted to do some follow-up? Yeah, thanks very much. <coughs> Convener, I wonder if I could just ask uh, the principal to clarify this issue about the EC units that was raised by Colin Beatty here. The, the submission we have says this. Um, our survey showed that many of these units had no teaching materials, no class time provided, and no final assessment, yet they could still attract funding. Is that correct? Or is that a misinterpretation, or is it wrong? Um, 
Convener, I haven't seen the survey. I haven't, it's not a survey that was carried out by the college, so I'm assuming it was a survey that was carried out by the IS among EIS members, and I've not seen that. I would welcome seeing that survey. In terms of the um, allegations that are in that uh, statement, um, I think it would be useful for me to see the evidence that the IS have got. But what I can say is that we do have very robust processes around what we claim, how we claim it, the, the protocols that we stick to, most of which are set down by the Funding Council. And to try to reassure the committee, the reassurance I get is as well as having internal procedures uh, that we work on ourselves as a senior management, We've been audited three times this year. We've been audited by internal audit on our credit claim. We've been audited by the Scottish Funding Council, in addition to the normal audits that we would get on those claims. And we've been, funded, we've been audited also by Audit Scotland as part of their general audit work and the Section 22 work. And none of these audits have thrown up such a problem. So, like the committee, I'm not cited on that survey and would welcome the opportunity to see it. Okay, so, so that's fine, but in general, if do EC units, are there any possibilities that EC units have no materials, class time or final assessments so, associated with So if I can just kind of go back again, convener, to the explanation that I gave earlier, EC units can be used for a number of different things. I gave the example of the, uh, of the French example. So the bit that we're claiming an EC code for there is the additional work that you do with students to prepare them for the exam. So if we weren't able to claim that, it would mean we would have to be hiring staff for a part of the course that otherwise we wouldn't be able to claim uh, credits for. But I think the committee would recognise that preparing students for their SQA exams is an essential part of any teaching year. So it's a device that's used for that. So the teaching materials related to that would be the teaching materials that have been taught in the two units. If I give you another example, we also use EC codes for teaching higher education students who are, on a, who are doing higher education with us but on their way to a course with a university. So we're running a course on behalf of a university. We, we would be using the EC codes to help with that and there would certainly be teaching materials. The staff themselves are responsible for preparing the teaching materials and for doing the planning. So if there are no teaching materials, then uh, I'm surprised that there would be such a thing, we would need to ask the staff whose class it was why they hadn't prepared teaching materials. So there's no reason why those EC codes shouldn't be claimed. They're a legitimate part of how you make up the costing of a college. And there should be no area of the college where we're claiming for something. We certainly know we're not claiming for things we didn't do. So, um, so again, I would repeat that I can't see a circumstance in which that would happen, but I'd be happy to have that evidence. And is that additional work assessed at all? Um, it's assessed as part, so in the case of the French, it's assessed as part of the overall examination. So the students at the examination, so if you imagine, if, you know, people are very familiar with what happens in schools, you, you hire a teacher for the whole year to teach a class. Some of that will be the component units of the, the, of the uh, course. Some of it is the preparation for exams, and that's normally what our staff and our colleagues in schools would be doing um, from anything from February, March, April, right up to the point of the exam. So if we weren't able to claim for that, then we wouldn't have the funding to hire the teachers to do that part of the course. So it's a legitimate part of the, the way in which um, colleges are made up in terms of their funding. Um, it, the paper goes on to say about resulting these things, and it's meant to be pass, fail or withdrawn, but it says here the EC code for higher national five, advanced higher, you taught, needs to be resulted with a P. This does not indicate that the student passed the exam, but they were prepared for the exam. And it goes on to say, so not only are the students credited with a pass when they've not actually passed anything, but some of the resulting is done by administrative means and does not even involve the lecturer. I mean, what do you say to that? So there are, um, first of all, I would say, and we're getting to very technical territory here, but the, um, the, there's two elements to, to resulting. 
Um, we introduced a, 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 an approach to resulting this year, which meant that students were resulted before lectures went on holiday. One of the problems I uh, faced when I came to Edinburgh College the first year I was here, I found that um, a number of lectures had gone on holiday that hadn't completed the resulting. So students weren't able to be credited in time for their, their course in university or to get their care inspectorate registration. It was a whole range of things that were problematic. So we introduced a, a, a system of uh, resulting that made sure that the lecturers did the bit that only they knew how to do. So in other words, they would be the only ones who could say what the marks for the students were and whether they passed or failed. But it's not just a case of pass, fail and withdrawn. Our mark system include the lecturer giving the mark indicating whether the student has passed. Uh, they can mark it as candidate withdrawn. They can mark it as merit pass or fail or distinction or a C or a B or an A. There's a whole range of things. So I wasn't clear about what that statement was referring to, but staff must result the students in terms of their work. But managers can actually do things like the EC codes because they've planned the courses and they know how much teaching went into that. I hope that's it can be, and I hope that's not too technical an answer, but it's quite a technical area. We were following well, you. Thanks for that. I mean, I'll, I'll ask uh, right, other colleagues to come in on that, but thank you for offering an explanation for that. Okay, Alex Neil. Good morning. Um, the last time you were here, the deficit for the college for the last financial year, 2015-16, uh, was stated as being seven million pounds. Uh, is the final figure? Was, was the final figure up to £8 million? No, no, it's still at £7 million. Seven that's million. that's it completed, yeah. Right, OK. And I'm told that represents well over 80% of all the total deficit in the college sector that year in Scotland. Is that right? Uh, I'm not certain. I didn't uh, look at that. Right. Yeah. Uh, and can I ask, uh, obviously, we've just completed a new, another financial year. Um, presumably, your financial year runs to April, does it? Uh, it runs to the end of July. Oh, it's the end of uh, July. An academic year. We run so have you any yeah. estimated outturn for this financial year? Uh, excluding the actuarial pension valuation, which we don't uh, know until August, uh, it's, uh, we're forecasting £3.4 uh, That was against a starting budget of deficit, and that's against a starting uh, budget at, at the start of the year, £3.8 Right. So there's an improvement against uh, 3.8. And when do you expect to get into break-even? Break-even... We, we are making very good progress. We've had a uh, successful voluntary severance scheme so far. Uh, we've taken a lot of non-pay costs out as well. Uh, we are in line with the transformation plan. Uh, la the forecast for 18-19 transformation plan, or should I say 17-18 transformation plan, is a 580,000 deficit. Uh, that's what we're looking at at this point in time for next year. So we're in line with the transformation plan. And in the following year, uh, we're looking at a break-even position. Uh, and that's notwithstanding the the National Pay Awards. Yeah. Now, when you say that's notwithstanding the National Pay Award, what impact will the National Pay Award have on those figures? Well, on Edinburgh College, uh, we uh, estimate that around about £6 million will be charged. But, however, we've put that into our forecasting and we're currently making plans to address the £6 million over the next four or five years. So when you say there's going to be a deficit next year estimated of about half a million pounds, um, does that... Is it, is that assuming you will have met your obligations under the national agreement? Uh, for this year, it would be. Yes. That's incorporated. Uh, yeah. And for next year? Yes, next year. Right. Uh, Mr. I mean, Sorry. Just... So it's wearing a different hat, convener, but I've had a wee bit more knowledge of the national pay bargaining than my colleagues here since I was, I was uh, involved in that. Uh, that circumstance obviously was not known at the time that we were drawing up our transformation plan. Um, but the, you know, particularly the uh, effect of it, you know, it's not just like a year on year. It's it's a, a effectively a, a lot of harmonisation and so on in there as well. I think you will find. I'm not saying that the committee will be spending even more time on further education matters, but I think you will find that the effect of the uh, current deal that is under discussion and as it plays through into support staff as well which is further down the line, your committee may have uh, more discussions with a larger number of colleges as to the effect, the knock-on effect of that. And we're, we've been actively in discussion with government about that. Um, as I say, it's a, that, that I think was something that would have been unforeseen at any individual college level, if you see what I mean. It's, it's one of the consequences of moving from 
individual bargaining at a, a, a college level to a, a national, uh, not just national bargaining, but a national deal of that sort, which you know will affect colleges. You know, some colleges will be affected worse than others, but the knock-on effect overall will actually be quite considerable across the sector. Can I just go back to, to Edinburgh College and ask about commercial income, because I believe there's been a fairly recent appointment of a new assistant principal uh, who, whose remit includes commercial income. Uh, am I right in saying that commercial income has pretty well frizzled out, uh, in, for example, in 1516? I don't think you would a lot of commercial income, is that right? Right. Well, in uh, 2015-16, uh, the commercial actually they hit their target. Although, if you if you were to go back to, sorry, the uh, uh, the commercial overall was about six million between commercial and international. Right. Okay. So they hit their target uh, overall, uh, both of them. However, uh, there has been a decline in the commercial and international since probably about 2013-14. What's the decline? What, can you give us some figures? Well, on international, which I think was mentioned at the last meeting. Uh, international has dropped by 1.1 million, which was 46%. And that was really in relation to the policy changes of the UK border agency. Uh, that impacted on college students, and that would be across the whole college uh, nationally. Thank you, convener. Um, we have, as uh, Mr Neil correctly says, we've, in, we've um, appointed a new head of commercial and international, actually, and a new assistant principal in com commercial and international. And although uh, the commercial and international uh, financial return hasn't been what we would expect it to be, we're actually ambitious about growing that for the future. Um, we obviously will work within the economic constraints that we have in Scotland, but actually Edinburgh has a very particular kind of economy and we think there's an opportunity for us really to be growing our commercial income in that area, not least because there are actually more, there are fewer people out of work in Edinburgh. So we need to be shifting some of our effort to from not just making sure that all young people who need a place at college have got one, but also making sure that those people are going straight into work from school, that we're providing those employers with opportunities to train on the job. So we're ambitious about that. In terms of um, inter the international position, um, there are, uh, and I know Mr Coffey asked about that at a previous meeting, there are two elements to that. One in six, almost one in five of our students are EU students. So that's something that we have to consider in the current uh, political climate with regard to Brexit. But with regard to international students who are not EU students, um, they were affected by the, cho the change in rules, uh, the Tier 4 visa rules. And in 2012-13, we had 215 international students. That fell after the Tier 4 rules changed to, two, uh, to 128 the following year. And we now only have 29 students in the current academic year. So that's an area that has certainly seen a decline uh, as a result in the change of visa rules for further education. But nonetheless, we believe that, um, that there's an opportunity for us to grow our commercial income, and we would seek to do so. And, and go back to those f forecast figures for this, the outturn this year and next year, um, as against the six million figure, what are you forecasting for commercial income? Can it, it just the same. At this point, six million. Yeah, right. to be but, as a minimum, to be prudent. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. My final question is: uh, obviously, um, with what's going on in the past, we have to look uh, to see what lessons are learned for the future. Um, and obviously, um, the role of the board is extremely important, as outlined in the exchange between Colin and Ian. What? How much does the board delegate to the P&R committee? I mean, does the, the board um, take primary responsibility or is it now delegating maybe too much to the P&R committee? Is the, is, the, is the whole board, I mean, who makes up the P&R committee? Is it dominated by non-executive directors? Uh, you know, can you tell us how, what the modus operandi of the board today is? Because um, obviously part of our concern is to make sure we don't get a repeat of the problems that we've had in the recent past? I think, again, that would be coming towards me, and you're very well informed of my structure of my board, Alex, and I, 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 <laughs> I commend you on that. 
I think it's a good point, however, and that you and I have had discussions in the past with different hats on as to how well, in fact, public sector governance can and should operate. I think uh, part of the answer that I was trying to give Colin was that the board, through that period, you know, very much had to look at itself and had to look at the processes and procedures, the very, the very structures, and actually not just the structures, but the dynamic as well of how we were coming to decisions and how we were following up decisions. You rightly say that we uh, introduced, I think, around that time, the PNR committee itself, because we didn't have one before. And if you think about that process I was describing uh, in uh, answer to uh, Colin Beattie, um, you were relying, therefore, from board meeting to board meeting to be able to pick up and to follow up what had, was becoming an, a, a sort of active chase on your part. Yeah? It was important, therefore, that we were able to start to focus that in, in our structures, to allow for the, the, the board to have a, a committee that was you know, much more actively involved in that. If you think about it, your audit committee is always there as a safety net. You know, it's post hoc catching. But what you didn't have and what became an obvious need was something that was much more looking forward and, you know, planning ahead. And if you like taking that, you know, boards have always got uh, compliance and strategy. They, you know, that, that's your two pillars that any board, I'm sorry if it's grannies and eggs here, but that, you know, that's the two pillars we have. We were sound, I thought, on our audit side but we weren't able to follow up on that strategic side. And that's where the, the uh, policy and resources came in. It also was part of the thinking uh, of us uh, trying to be as transparent as we could with SFC in addressing that first financial issue. Because I don't know whether it comes out in your paperwork, you'll see that SFC was very involved. They were actually at the table from day one. I mean, in, in the, we had a... When we first set up the first uh, recovery plan with the interim principle, we established an actual joint committee with SFC. So it wasn't that we were making up, you know, coming up with policies and taking them to the SFC. We were actually making them up jointly with the SFC in order to, to find a way out of this. Because it seemed to me at the time that there was no point in being anything other than fully transparent in a situation like that. Now, once we changed the structure of the board to introduce the Policy and Resources Committee and give us... Um, that ability to be more strategic in, in, in those key areas, we continued to practice that for those items that are to do with our business transformation plan and related areas, uh, SFC actually sits at the table with us. Representatives from SFC are there. They're actually taking part in that decision. And we very often will actually quiz them in much the same way as you're quizzing me, uh, you know, for the point. Dominated by non-executive directors. It'll tend to be mostly non-execs. Uh, it's not. None of our committees will have, you know, executives. But again, you've got to remember the makeup of a college board. The, they're great. They're large boards anyway, with a lot of non-execs. Um, they, but we'll also have uh, student representatives, staff representatives, and so on. So you'll find spread across what is quite a lot of committees on that board. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have, I suppose, appropriate representation going forward. My own view, and it, it would be a view I would hold outside of this process, it would, you know, I think it would also be based on my work in institute of directors and so on, is that where you are looking for decisions to be made that can be shown to be outside of any kind of pressure or, you know, interest that someone may have, the safest road for a board is, is through the non-executives at that time, because the non-executives are the ones that can be shown you know, not to have a, an axe to grind. Therefore, personally, in situations like that, I would rely on non-executive. And, and I'm, I'm lucky in, in uh, Edinburgh's board that I have some very, very experienced and good non-executives. But, but the role of the PNR committee, and I hear you saying about the need for a PNR committee, and I accept that, um, but it's not diluting the effectiveness of the board itself. No, I, I certainly wouldn't think that. I think actually it's the opposite. Because again, these are, let me choose my words carefully. Public sector can be quite cumbersome in the way in which it goes about things sometimes. It doesn't always have the speed of action that's available within the private sector or even in the third sector in a lot of its work. Uh, this is a problem that I'm sure you've come across the same as me in previous roles. Um, in that situation, I think you need to have structures, therefore, that make that work easier. 
And the whole point of the structural change that I brought in to establish the, the Policy and Resources Committee was that it was giving us the ability to move quickly and with more agility between board meetings. The board only meets four or five times a year. So, you know, when you're in the situation we were in at that time, you needed a, an awful lot more agility and ability to, uh, you know, shift things forward. And so that was the reason for that change. And I think it has worked. Finally, can I just say, convener, I give my apologies. I have to leave in the next few minutes to another committee meeting. My apologies. No problem at all. Thank you. Um, Willie Coffey had a small supplementary on the back of Alex Neil's question. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, back to Principal, could you just uh, clarify, please? You, you said the, the impact in knowing EU international students. So the figures you gave us there, you had 215, I think it was, in 2014. That's dropped to... 13. 2012, 13, yeah. but it's dropped to 29. It's no. 29 in the current year, ah. and we had a drop in um, 13, 14 to 128. So ah. from the ah. point at ah. which the it's change in, the, in yeah. the UK uh, legislation came in, yeah. it's, it's dropped significantly. It's very, very difficult can you put for value? students. <laughs> Sorry, can, can you, you put a value on that, what that's cost, effectively yeah, cost the cost? When that, the, the drop in the non EU international yeah. students, as okay. a result of those changes, those policy changes, cost the college £1.1 £1. 1 million. Yeah. Pounds. Yes. Annually. Of course, yeah. is there any prospect of you of that recovering? I know you're making efforts to, to extend yeah. your interest in commercial income yeah. elsewhere, as you said to yeah. Mr Neil, but is there any prospect of that? We are making efforts. Uh, there's also, um, uh, just to add into that, there's a, there's a different mode of delivery now required by overseas uh, uh, companies, in effect, where they prefer the delivery in the homeland rather than students coming across to Edinburgh uh, to study. So we've had to change the model of delivery also on that. Uh, so if there is any growth, I would suspect the growth will come from delivery in another country. Thank you. OK. Liam. Thank you, Convener. No. Good morning. Uh, I just want to, at the outset, look at um, uh, just getting a bit of clarity over something. Uh, we talked, or th there, there's been a lot of talk throughout this process about this additionality. Uh, and various funding issues. Now, it, back in November, we met, and the college was very clear to accept that there had been failings, uh, and it accepted those failings in general terms and said, look, that a lot of cooks were involved in this. Uh, but by the time of the Audit Scotland report, uh, the principal concluded that the vice president of curriculum and quality was the responsible person for the additionality issue. Why is there a difference between what I was told in response to my question in November and what Audit Scotland are reporting? Thank you, Convener. Um, Audit Scotland were actually using information that I, that I provided to them as part of their Section 22. Um, the, di the difference, I think I, I think I said to the committee when I, when I met with you in November, and I still hold this view, that part of the problem lay with the structure, and that there were several vice principals, there were two vice principals, and a, a deputy principal, who all had a bit of responsibility for making sure that curriculum frameworks were sound, but nobody seemed to have the overall responsibility. I subsequently carried out a review, as you're aware, because you've seen it in the Audit Scotland report, as well as me reporting that to you myself, that says that that there were failings in the way the structure had been set up, so everybody and nobody had responsibility. By the time I concluded my investigation and was reporting to the PNR committee and the board on that, the responsibility for having sorted that out then lay with the vice principal curriculum, who by then had taken on a new role and was in a role which had all the component parts of that responsibility. My conclusion in those findings, which I reported to you, were that um, the new responsibilities, the responsibilities now lay within the new role of the uh, vice principal of curriculum. So there were two components to my findings. One was, the previous structure had muddied the water and everybody and nobody was responsible. And then in the first few months in which I was in post, a new appointment had been made matched in of a vice principal curriculum. 
I concluded in that report that the problems that were current at that time lay within the purview of the vice principal curriculum. So at that point, the board uh, asked me to then, so that was, a, that was a, um, a, an investigation into the general situation. The board then instructed me to consider whether there was a case to be answered in terms of competence. And the committee will be aware that if you decide to commence or down a competency route, you have to carry out a competency investigation that hadn't been done. And you have to then have a competency hearing, which gives people the right to reply to any accusations that are made against them. And that hadn't been done. And that wasn't done because the vice principal in question resigned his post. Yes. And just for clarity, though, because it, that all tallies. But the answer that I was given in November was very clearly, when I put the direct question, who is responsible for this? The answer that I got was everyone and no one. And then when the Audit Scotland report comes out, there's a very clear conclusion drawn by yourself that one person was responsible. So may I ask, which is it? Was that one person yeah. responsible for what went wrong? Kimbeer, I'll try and I'll try and clarify um, for Mr. Kerr. Um, the difficulty here is that I concluded that the problem lay in the area of one person's new remit. What I hadn't the opportunity to do was actually to carry out a competency investigation or a competency hearing. And I think the committee will understand that until an investigation, so the investigation I did was into the general situation, not into anyone's competency. So I could not even at this point in time draw a conclusion to this committee that someone was incompetent when they'd not had the benefit of a competency hearing, the opportunity to defend themselves, or indeed a competency investigation. So what I can say with certainty is that the area of difficulty that we were experiencing lay within that vice principal's remit, that actually the former structure caused an all or nothing, an everybody and nobody problem. But it's very difficult to point the finger at someone who hadn't had the opportunity to either defend themselves or to go through a competency procedure, because those competency procedures were never carried out because the vice principal resigned his post. Do you maintain that the entirety of the problems were down to one person? I've never maintained that, convener. I've always said that it was a combination of a, a poor structure and failings on more than one person's behalf. But at the point at which I concluded my investigation into the situation, the area of difficulty lay within the new remit of a then vice principal. So if more than one person was responsible, what's happened to the other people who were responsible? Um, well, one person left us because their post ceased to exist in the structure. Uh, uh, they left under voluntary severance. So they, they got but, the payoff. But just to be clear to the committee, I'm not suggesting that that person was incompetent. I'm suggesting that that, that, person, had a re that person had a remit that was partly responsible. Right. And uh, Mr Williamson, if I may, you were part of the team during this period. Isn't that correct? That's right. Yes, I was. So, uh, Ms Bruton, uh, is Mr Williamson partly responsible for what happened? Well, I suppose corporately the entire team were responsible. What I would, what I would say, and I think I said this to the committee the last time, um, I believe I said to the committee, I maybe didn't make it explicit, uh, Mr Williamson was extremely helpful to me when I was carrying out my investigation and actually came forward to help me with a lot of the problems that, were, that the board were seeking to identify. I think I'll move on uh, at this stage. The voluntary severance scheme, so we'll look forward now for May. Uh, this is key to the transformation plan. Uh, I think the Audit Scotland report talks about it being primarily, or the, the transformation plan is primarily dependent on the transformation plan working. You're in the third phase of the voluntary severance scheme. Uh, you launched that in April 2017, and that is focusing on the academic staff uh, with the intention of saving nearly two and a half million pounds, I believe. So first question, where are we on that? Has the scheme closed? And how many applications of the hoped for 51 
have you actually received? Convener, I'll start, if I may, and then pass over to Ms Williamson, who will give you uh, the details around that. Yes, we've now concluded three voluntary severance schemes. Um, the third voluntary severance scheme was open to staff from across support and the academic staff. Uh, the reason that we were able to open it uh, more fully to academic staff was that we had completed our curriculum review in advance of the third voluntary severance scheme. And you may remember that from uh, the Section 22 report, and I think the responses that uh, the Auditor General gave. So we've concluded three voluntary severance schemes now. Um, we still have a, a gap to close in terms of funding, but it's been lar very largely successful in getting the reduction in uh, staffing we need, as well as reduction in finance. And the reason that we were welcoming applications from curriculum staff in phase three of that scheme was to enable us to see which areas of the curriculum we needed to grow and which areas of the curriculum would be contracting, because clearly we wouldn't be letting staff go in areas where we were trying to grow. So we were able to accept uh, applications where they were affordable, because the SFC set the rules for what's affordable in terms of VS, and where it was an area where we knew that we wouldn't, that students wouldn't be suffering. So we needed to make sure it was an area where it wasn't an area of growth. But Mr Williamson can give you some of the financials and the shortfall uh, that we have still to meet on that. OK. Um, from the, the target uh, up to 2017-18 for the budget year we're just coming into, we had a target for the voluntary savings scheme of 3.8 million. At this point in time, we have uh, achieved with 3.5 although we are at uh, a stage where we are currently reviewing some other applications. We are oversubscribed in applications. We had around about 103 applications. We have accepted 54, and we are currently looking at the applications to see if there are any others we can release. Just out of interest, you were advanced £1.85 from the SFC, I think, to, to make this happen. Uh, on, on the figures you have just given, Mr Williamson, yes. it has not quite achieved what you had hoped for? Uh, it's cost so far uh, one million, and that's released one point six. But what happens to the SFC funding, just for clarity? Well, the SFC funding will they will take the, the money back uh, if we're not using it. Uh, however, uh, we still have a bit to go uh, to finalise uh, the scheme, and whatever balance is remaining, uh, the funding council will keep it. Okay. Could I perhaps just, just clarify on that last point, um, picking up on you not quite having achieved their target? It's still in process, and it's not just us that make the decision. The SFC have to make the decision as to whether some people that we might wish to go are actually you know, fit within a, a framework with them. So you know, that is still work in progress in terms of whether that... You'll see that we're very close to the target, but I would remind you that you know, there's more in this marriage than just us. Uh, we need to have the SFC's approval as well. So there is still actually... Uh, ongoing discussions here. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll bring in Liam Kerr in a minute because I'm conscious Monica Lennon needs to be elsewhere. Um, so I'd like to invite her to ask her questions. Thank you, Convener. I do need to excuse myself just before 10 um, for probably 15 20 minutes or so, and I'll come back from another committee. Um, good morning, everyone. The college's financial position remains challenging. Now, I'm aware that in the Audit Scotland report, um, there's some caution there that any adverse fluctuations in income or costs could affect the college's ability to repay the 2.9 million transformation funding to the funding council and that the college could require further support. Mr Williamson, you've given some detail on, on the deficit figures and that seems to be coming down and that's, that is encouraging. Um, but Mr Mackay, in your opening remarks, you mentioned national pay bargaining and then later you talked about that been an unforeseen circumstance. Um, could I just perhaps ask Mr. William, Mr. Williamson, sorry, um, what scenario planning has been undertaken in respect of of national pay commitments? And then I'll come to Mr. Mackay with some questions. Well, we have included a five-year forecast, a financial forecast, which incorporates both the national pay award and the repayment of the 2.9 million. On the 2.9 million, we're in. Uh, discussion at the moment with the Funding Council about an appropriate payback period. And can I just clarify, when did you start to build in the national pay um, costs into your planning work? Uh, as, soon as, we heard, uh, as soon as we started to see the outcome of the national pay discussions, we started to include them in the financial projections. Could you give a more specific date on that, please? Well, 
it would have been probably in the, uh, I would have thought probably about three months ago when we, we got the, uh, we received some of the figures of what the implications were. Okay, but you are aware that the, the agreements were reached some time ago. Well, Mr. Williamson. Yeah, well, the the agreement was reached, but yes. the financial consequences of it were not because we're still to understand exactly what the the funding elements of that will be, uh, and whether we're going to be supported. Okay, uh, and what, what support um, are you expecting? Well, we don't know what support we're expecting, but uh, in the initial April to July period, the funding council have given uh, all colleges a level of support for the first uh, four months of the the. 25% uh, uh, award. Okay. I think Mr Mackay, you wanted to come in. I, I was simply going to say that no, these, these decisions weren't made some time ago and the, the final outcome in fact is still not known in terms of the uh, national uh, agreement, in terms of what the actual cost will be college to college. National agreements signed? Uh, you're taxing my, my uh, memory here, but it was in, in May that we had these uh, discussions with EIS. Okay. So again, just to and we haven't actually confirm concluded. for the record, you, you mentioned you wear another hat. Maybe just tell everyone what that hat is. I'm chair of the Employers Association, and as okay. part of that, I was, I was uh, involved in those negotiations. But okay. in fact, that negotiation, we concluded, or we, we got pretty close in terms of uh, pay cost, but we've still not identified the final terms and conditions changes. And those terms and conditions changes will actually in some ways have a much more significant effect for some colleges than others. If you, you, know, if you change the national class contact hours from 24 to 23, or from 21 to 23 for an individual college, in some ways that will have you know, as much uh, effect as the actual increase in someone's wages. That, that still is not concluded. Okay, I'm a bit confused about some of the, the timescales here because Mr Williamson seems to be saying that it's only in the last three months that the work has been carried out to look at the, the, the costs and the obligations. Um, as the chair of the Employers Association, you've got an important seat at the table, Mr Mackay, um, but uh, you've been clearly acknowledging that the agreement had been reached some time ago. clarify for you. Would that be helpful? Yes, it would be helpful. What normally happens in a collective bargaining situation is that at the same time as you're actually face-to-face -face in collective bargaining, you're also working out the numbers as you go along. Because the, as something is put on the table or removed from the table, you have to know what the actual cost of that is. You have to know whether it's affordable. You also, in our situation, where we have the employers, it's a, it's a voluntary collective bargaining scheme which the government is not uh, at the table, but it would be foolish in our situation for us not to at least check with government and the SFC as to whether the kinds of things that are being talked about at the table, you know, A, makes sense in their numbers, because let's remember this is quite a new sector to actually work out the numbers for the whole sector, but we have to check whether in fact there will be support from government for whatever deal it is that comes out the other end. Now, all of that is happening during, it's not, you know, it's not a fixed situation. The, what uh, Alan is talking about is that throughout this process, which has gone on for some time, what we have been doing uh, parallel to this is working out the prospective numbers as we've gone along, getting those double-checked by SFC and running them past government as well, so that in the actual collective bargaining room, so to speak, we're, we're having a real discussion. We're having a, a discussion which can, you know, can then be uh, brought into fruition. Part of that has been checking back with colleges what the likely outcomes are going to be. Now, I think it would be prudent for any finance directors across the whole sector to be having a good look at likely outcomes of those bar you know, what's going to come out of that bargaining throughout that process. That, I think, is what we're talking about here. Getting to the point at which you know the actual cost. In fact, I think that the official, you know, I don't know, again, whether you're aware of how the procedures work in collective bargaining and, at this level, but what happens in the end is that there will be a circular will come out from the joint secretaries, and that's the legal document that says this is what you have to do. The first of those, actually, I think, came out last week in terms of the first payment, uh, down payment, so to speak, that, that is going to, we're hoping to be paying on this in uh, July to our teaching staff. 
Now, in fact, that is just the first of those. There will, be, there will be others that will follow. So, in a way, the first time that you actually knew exactly what it was going to cost you was last week when that circular came out. But it would be prudent for finance directors to be, you know, seeing the way that the wind is blowing and trying to take account of that in their thinking from there on. I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm sure it's in the Audit Scotland report that the, the annual pay increases had been agreed um, in 2015, but uh, perhaps um, you know better. But we can clarify that afterwards. Yes, I've <laughs> OK. Well, I'll move on, because I appreciate it's not all about national bargaining today, but I think um, you've made some interesting remarks, Mr Mackay. Now, we've talked about your financial situation. In terms of opportunities to make savings, um, estate management, there's a review underway. Um, now, I'm interested to know what impact that will have across the four campuses, um, your approach to that, and how that might impact on students and the, the curriculum review, perhaps uh, Ms Bruton would like to go first. Thanks very much. And convener, I'll make a couple of remarks and then I'll pass to Mr Williamson because it sits in his uh, uh, remit. Um, we had a, a review done of our estate because there have been a lot of discussion since merger about things like, well, could we save money by closing a campus? And, you know, th that's really unsettling for staff when you have that level of uncertainty. So we've had a review carried out um, by an external party. And um, one of the things that that review showed us was actually the four campuses that we have are, are just about the right size for the number of students we've got. So that was extremely helpful. Um, I mean, it's probably more expensive to run four campuses than to run one, but our four campuses are in uh, some of the most deprived areas in our region. Um, they're well located, and actually the size of the buildings themselves are about right for the level of activity we've got. We could expand a little, but not very much. So the focus on the estate has been about looking at the areas of our provision that we need to make the, the, the ch a change to for curriculum reasons and it's focused really around construction and engineering because those are the areas where we really, really need to modernise. So what we're looking at is we might need to make a shift of some curriculum areas or build some new provision on one of those sites but at the moment that's the scope of the of the review that we've been undertaking, but Mr Williamson can add a little bit mm. more detail because he's responsible for yeah. this. Okay, just to follow on, uh, is that uh, what we've been looking at uh, are the options for construction and engineering in particular, uh, mainly on the basis that the, the, the facilities there really need uh, investment, and we're looking at some centralisation. Uh, the capacity uh, issues uh, following the report, uh, the capacity is probably close to the right size, uh, if you look at the four campuses in general. Uh, in addition to that, we're also looking at a potential uh, joined-up approach uh, with other institutions in the West Corridor uh, of Edinburgh. And similarly, every, every year and on an ongoing basis, we look at how we are uh, increasing the room utilisation, i.e. How, how do we get more students into classes, uh, for example. That might be knocking down walls. Uh, we're also investing in sustainability. Uh, we're looking at LED lighting at this point in time. We're looking at replacing electricity with gas workshops uh, instead. Uh, combined heat power plant we're looking at from uh, additional funding from the Funding Council at this point in time. So there's a lot of sustainability uh, elements we're looking at. On a, on a financial savings side, uh, we're probably looking at around about six to 700,000 is probably what we're, we've been saving. And there's potential for more once we put the investment in from uh, of 1.3 million. That figure of 600 to 700,000 is that going to be an annual saving? Or that's a recurring saving. That's a recurring saving. Yes. Okay, but broadly speaking, you're committed to retaining four campuses. Um, interesting comments about um, construction and engineering. I'm on the cross party group on construction. It's a clear an interest. So I know that that's, that's an important area. But Mr. Mackay, you said in your opening remarks that that you've tailored courses to reflect the needs of local communities. Um, can you explain the approach to that and how that's how you know that that, that is working for local communities? We had uh, one of the, you know part of this process that we've gone through has involved an awful lot of looking at ourselves and our processes and 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 indeed not just you know how do we count the beans but how do we actually reflect the job that we're there to do and, and in fact part of the process. Uh, at a board meeting when we were having a report on the initial transformation plan uh, where we were uh, you know, seeking to make financial savings, 
it came to light because we had a report from uh, Ruth Silver, uh, who some of you may be aware of, did a, a, a big report on widening access uh, uh, up here. Uh, Ruth had actually carried out some work along with uh, people from, I think it was SDS and from SFC and so on. SFC had paid for a really interesting, useful piece of work that was done for the Glasgow colleges in order to basically go and ask all of the key stakeholders where we were, feed that back into the college, match it against the college's, you know, in, that, in their case, the three colleges' um, output, and start to make changes, therefore, you know, to make sure that you did match what your community actually needed. When we heard about that, uh, we were very quick to say, hang on, we'll have some of that as well, please. And we'd like, you know, will the SFC fund us? Because it was a considerable expense. Well, the SFC fund us to do a considerable, you know, the same job of work for Edinburgh and the, the Lothians that we represent. Funding. So it's based on that. We did that initial work. And then that acted, I think, as the starting point for the much larger piece of work that the principal and the education people have done in our curriculum since then. So, you know, that gives us a bit of confidence that we're working off the, um, you know, views and the attitudes that are coming from our, you know, partner councils and, and so on that we're working with. Thank you. I need to be standards committee in a few minutes. I don't want to be late or I'll be in trouble. So I'll just finish by um, picking up on, again, the reflections on governance. Mr Mackay, you did say that the board wasn't perfect and nobody is perfect. But in hindsight, um, what would you have done differently? And as the chairperson and, and I suppose for other board members, have you undergone any, any training to, to upskill and improve? We've actually, I think Edinburgh, uh, we introduced at Edinburgh from day one some of the processes that are now being introduced across the whole sector in terms of board review, in terms of review of the chair themselves, an independent review of the chair themselves, in terms of an independent review, a third party independent review of the way in which the board works. We actually introduced all of those from day one, uh, from when Edinburgh College was established. Those same processes are now being introduced across the whole sector, mostly you know, because of the, the you know, damaging reputational things that there have been elsewhere within the sector uh, in the last three or four years. I think personally that's a very good move and it's in line with the, my own work that I've done through institute directors and so on. What would we have done differently? Hindsight, as this committee probably knows better than most, is uh, a wonderful thing. And had we known uh, from day one that we should be looking much more uh, closely at the, you know, the very uh, specific way in which we were uh, gathering students, you know, the actual numbers of, of students that were participating and so on, and that, in fact, there was a capacity out there in the community to, you know, feed the, what we thought was the size of the college when we first put it together, then that would have been by far the best place to go. You're right that I said that, the, you know, boards make mistakes. I also said I have some very good um, people on my board, and I think that the, the only thing that boards can do is to learn from that and, and seek to change thereafter. I said in my answer to Alec Neil, we've changed a lot of the structures in the board to make it, it more functional. And actually, on the commercial and international, that's one of the other things that we had done because we saw that problem coming and we wanted to react to that. We've reacted to the ability of the board to move more quickly when it deals with things like this. And actually, the stuff that you guys have done in pointing us towards areas that we, we maybe need to look at more closely, we've also taken on board because there is very little point in any of us who are charged with trying to get the best for the public purse and not listening to people and not changing the way in which we do things. So, you know, we're quite grateful for that. We have made a number of changes and I am as confident as any football manager can ever be that in fact they're starting to get the thing right and moving forward and I'm sure if I had a chair he would say that he had, he had full confidence in me uh, and we all know what that means. Um, I, think that, I think we have done what we can. I think we're very conscious that public money is involved and I think that, but can I just say one thing perhaps, Chair, which may be helpful to the committee generally. In preparation for this, in looking at Carolyn Gardner's report that you're coming up to talk about in the next wee while, we started, I asked Alan to look at uh, our underlying accounts and our trends for the next three to four years. I was happy when Alan produced those figures for us that black ink 
was showing and was growing uh, for Edinburgh College. Because that, at the end of the day, as far as my board is concerned, and I'm sure as far as you're concerned, is the outcome that we want to see, that in fact we have managed to get to the bottom of these problems and we have managed to move forward uh, into a, a situation where the college's finances and working is much more stable. Thank you. Liam Kerr, do you want to return to your question? Yes, thank you, Kavinar. Um, uh, so we were talking about the voluntary severance scheme uh, and, and just looking forward how that will work. Uh, my understanding is that uh, an element of the voluntary severance scheme, or the, part of the decision on who will be chosen, who will be accepted, uh, is whether the course is efficient. Uh, and uh, I see from the report that inefficient courses are in danger of being removed. Or maybe I can go further and say inefficient courses will be removed. So just for clarity, what is efficiency? Is it purely financial? Uh, you, you mentioned, I think, Principal, earlier on that it would be where students wouldn't be suffering. Uh, so what is the definition of efficiency, please? So there are several elements to efficiency. One is class numbers. So, um, but it's, there's not an absolute number. So, for example, um, a course in business can run with much larger numbers of students than a course where we're making provision for young people with additional support needs. So, as you would expect, we set the course targets for each uh, subject area according to what's pedagogically sound, what breaks even, and it might be that we, we are even prepared to make a loss in some courses because those are vulnerable students or they're entry-level courses, and we know that if students pass those courses, they'll go on to sustain other courses and uh, get into work in future. So we set an efficiency quotient, quotient for each course on a case-by-case -case basis, so depending on... Uh, aspects like safety as well so you you might be able to have a class of 30 uh, undertaking a course in economics but you wouldn't have a class of 30 in a construction lab because it, it wouldn't be safe to do so so for every course in the college we've worked to identify what would be an efficient number so that's one element of efficiency another element of efficiency is the staff costs that go with it the overheads that go with it and um, we would seek to run for students um, every course we possibly could. We cannot run courses unless they are for students with, who are very vulnerable or who have additional support needs. We wouldn't be running courses of, with students of two or three and you wouldn't expect us to. So what we're trying to do is to maximise the benefits to students. And we're also trying to reduce courses where there is little or no demand. So there are some courses in the FE sector where the demand is tailing away. And there are other courses where the demand is growing. And it's slightly allied to um, Monica Lennon's question about uh, how do you get that right and the question she was asking about the curriculum. Because that's about uh, running uh, a curriculum for the future. And in the past, we've turned away too many students who wanted to come to Edinburgh College because they didn't have the qualifications they needed to get into college. So we're now investing more heavily in courses which are viable, which can run, and which give people the qualifications they need to get on to the, the, to the, the course they desire. So it, I'm afraid that it would, you know, it would be nice and simple if I was able to say, well, the quotient is 15, you know, or 20 or 25. But it depends, and we now have a very, very, very detailed analysis across the whole of our college about what the numbers have to be for each course. If a course isn't viable, then we seek to make sure that the students can either join another class, where there's another one running in parallel, could change the days to come on a course, or to find another course that suits them. So it's always a balance between student demand, uh, what the employer needs are, because equally there's no point in training students for something in which there are no jobs, and balancing all that up with the efficiency of the college, because we are spending public money. We don't have a blank cheque to run courses for everyone, regardless of whether they're efficient or not. Uh, can you just briefly give an example? What, what are some of the courses that uh, are inefficient and have thus been cut or scaled well, back? Well, what, what we've found in the past is that if we, say for example, we run 
uh, eight parallel childcare courses. And we've offered those courses on, in lots and lo on lots of different days. And we find that in each of those courses, we only get um, 14 students. Now, even with the national average of dropout, that's going to come down by a couple of students by the end of the year. That then begins to make that inefficient. But if, however, we can consolidate the days on which those courses run while maintaining as much flexibility as we can, we could actually combine those courses so that instead of running eight, you're running six, and then we would have more efficient numbers of 25, 26, 27 in childcare where it's possible to run courses eh, at that number. Cutting some courses? Um, we're not cutting any students, but we're cutting the number of occurrences of courses. Yes, so there will be less course options. Well, no, there won't be fewer course options. There may be fewer days on which it runs, or there may be right, less so flexibility. Yeah. Yes, so what impact assessment has been done by the college on the implications for students? Uh, and you mentioned the labour market there. Mm. So what impact assessment has been done on your ability to provide to the labour market and indeed to provide routes to university? Well, that's part of our wider curriculum review. And actually, um, far from cutting courses in the last couple of years, we've been introducing courses to meet that. Has there been an impact assessment done before undertaking the scheme that will result in There would in be an impact assessment undertaken if we were going to close a course. And there's always an impact assessment done when we're creating a new course. Has there been an impact assessment done? Because we heard earlier on there is a very far advanced voluntary severance scheme. There are very far advanced programmes to transform the product. What impact assessment has been done, past tense, to check the impact yeah. on the labour market, the students, the university progression? S so an impact assessment will have been done. We have done an impact assessment right. on the voluntary severance scheme and the effect that that would have. And uh, was that done in consultation with the students, the labour market, local employers? For I example? don't have the detail of that impact assessment with me. I would have to write to the committee about that. I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Um, obviously, you talk about adding students into courses, so the courses are now bigger. Uh, presumably, that will have a significant effect on staff uh, and the ability of the college with less people to deliver these bigger courses, the more subscribed courses. Uh, so what impact assessment has been done on the impact on the staff of the changes that are being made? I'm just checking with Mr Williamson because, again, this is HR's and Mr Williamson's uh, bailiwick. Uh, I believe that will have been done as part of the same, um, uh, the same impact assessment for the voluntary severance scheme. Perhaps if, if that could be provided. Yeah. Uh, and, and just one final thing, uh, which I just want to wrap up, and perhaps I might bring Mr Mackay back in here. Um, is there a danger... Mr Mackay, that in the drive for the financial stability that we've been talking about this morning, uh, however that instability, if I can put it that way, has been incurred, uh, that there is a negative impact on course provision, uh, on the learning journey uh, and the staff experience? I think that any change in any public service can always be regarded as having a negative effect somewhere. Uh, in this particular instance, the board has actually been at pains to come at this whole question from the opposite of what some of us might remember from the value for money days and so on of Mrs Thatcher and so on. Um, we've come at this, in fact, from what is the need that is out there. What is it, you know, what kind of curriculum should we be doing as Edinburgh College? Uh, what should we be offering? And using that as our driver as to how, in fact, we then produce a college which is efficiently delivering that. We actually, in discussions on the board, we made it clear that we did not want to see this as an exercise that was driven by cost cutting or by, you know, something that could then have the kind of unforeseen consequence that you're describing there. Because at the end of the day, 
that doesn't actually do what we need, you know, what needs to happen. Um, we've tried from the outset at Edinburgh College to take the best of what our legacy, you know, uh, the historic uh, FE provision in our area was, but learn from that and actually move it forward into something that the community wants. So I'm reasonably confident that in fact, we've started this from the, from the, the basis of what's good for students, what's good for our community, uh, and you know, make a college that, that delivers that, uh, and try and do it then in such a way that we're not having the consequence that, that you're referring to. Uh, whether we manage it or not, by all means, we can have that discussion either here or somewhere else and give us five years or something to see how it comes out. But as I say, I was very hopeful that in beginning to look forward and beginning to look at our underlying trends and beginning to look at uh, the stability of the college, that we're starting to see black ink there. And that is helpful for everyone. It's helpful for, you know, the general mood within the college. It's helpful for our staff. It, you know, it, it takes everyone forward, I think, at that point. And that's what the board wants to see. And I, I suspect that's what the executive wants to see, or indeed you want to see as well. And we look forward to seeing it. I have a couple of questions just to sweep up, and we will be very quick. Um, and I want to return to the EIS submission. Um, it, your explanation of the change to the system of withdrawals was such that you didn't want a withdrawal by a lecturer, you wanted to do follow-up, and I absolutely understand that. Um, so when is the withdrawal then reported? And based on the follow-up you are doing, how many of those students actually then re-engage with courses? The, the withdrawal is uh, reported as soon as we are certain that either uh, enough time has passed or so much time has passed that the student wouldn't be able to catch up or where the student uh, can tell us either face to face in writing that they're definitely not coming back. So that will vary from student to student. But clearly we're trying to get the students back in to their classes within a matter of days rather than a matter of weeks. Um, so that's reported as soon as we know that the student has withdrawn from the class. And I'm sorry, uh, convener, there was a second part to your question. Yeah, how do you know how successful you are? How many, in percentage terms, of these students actually return to their courses and re-engage? Um, well, this year, our retention rates are up significantly, so... Yeah, that um, my question. It's, it's the specific, those who are... Um, yeah. would otherwise have been marked as a withdrawal you're working with to get back into so the college. I would so need, I would need to give you that actual figure. What I can tell you is that um, last year we had 5.2% of our students withdraw. And then this current year, which is just ending tomorrow, we had 4.6% of our students withdraw. Okay. So my belief is that that change to that withdrawal system has helped to retain more students. OK, so the system itself isn't gaming the numbers. It's actually providing you with an early opportunity to engage with students. Both, yes. Yes, that's correct. OK. Can I go on to the resulting EC units mm -hmm. just very quickly? Um, because I, I absolutely understand what you're saying in the example you gave, I think, of a Nat 5 French preparation. Um, that would, would it not, involve teaching materials and class time? Uh, yes, it would. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you would, you, you would expect that if a student was being prepared for assessment, that would be using the materials that were needed for the, for the unit, but also the teacher would be preparing materials for okay. practice assessments and working with, staff, with students on what areas of their work, either individually or collectively, okay. they need to revise. So, so are you therefore in a position to guarantee that there is no resulting EC unit as a consequence, you know, that, that has no teaching materials, no class time, and no financial assessment in it. There should be no, uh, there should be no examples of where teacher time has not been used to support students in, a, for example, a studying for their exams. Okay. Would, would it you might be part of I, the overall cost of the staff for the whole year. But I'd be very happy to look at anything that anybody thinks is problematic. Yeah. I, mean, I would I, not expect to see that. OK, I would have thought that you as the principal would want to investigate that. I and will, that, indeed. That, that brings me to my next point. Um, you've, you've come to this committee asking for a survey conducted by the EIS. Um, and I wonder whether this doesn't point to, and let me be helpful, as I hope the committee can be. Um, we've had a number of items of correspondence from the EIS since 
the Section 22 report into Edinburgh College landed with this committee. Um, it strikes me, including today's example, that there is maybe a fundamental issue of communication between the college, the board, and indeed the EIS. And I wonder whether um, there is any activity that you're taking to address this. There is indeed, and actually it's been a kind of key element of the work I've been doing over the last two years is try and build industrial relations in the college. And in fact, we have some examples of excellent industrial relations in Edinburgh College because we have more than one union. Um, we, I've sought to introduce a whole range of measures to support partnership working, and some of my uh, EIS branch officials are sitting behind me, so uh, I can't see their faces, but you can. Um, it, it's, uh, I've always worked uh, well, I think, in any job I've done with our uh, trade unions. I believe that strong trade unions make for a very good workplace, and of course I'll continue to work towards better partnership working with the EIS in particular. Thank you, that's helpful. Monica Lennon wanted a quick oh, question. Thank you. The answer's probably no, but I thought I'd take the opportunity uh, since I was back quicker than expected. Um, an issue was raised with me very recently about another college, um, about a practice whereby students who drop out maybe after a couple of weeks, but certainly before December, are being um, pursued for um, you know, a, a fee repayment. Um, now, yeah, I can tell by looking at your face, it's probably not happening in Edinburgh College, but are, it's not happening in Edinburgh College. Are you aware of that practice? I'm not. No. No, and that's not part of your procedures. That's reassuring. Thank you. OK. Um, on the basis that I think we've concluded all questions from the committee, can I thank the witnesses for their attendance this morning? Um, and could I suspend the meeting briefly to allow a changeover in witnesses? Okay, can I move us to item three on the agenda, which is the Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme, and we'll take evidence from the Auditor General on her further update on the programme. I welcome the Auditor General and her colleagues from Audit Scotland, and can I invite an opening statement from the Auditor General? Thank you, Convener. Today's report looks at the progress the Scottish Government has made with delivering its Common Agricultural Policy Futures Programme since I last reported. It covers progress up to May 2017. Before I outline my findings, it's important to note that the rural payment system is working, processing applications and making payments, but it's not working as well as intended, and some parts of the system are still being developed and redesigned. I'd also like to acknowledge the tremendous efforts that staff right across the Agriculture and Rural Economy Directorate continue to make in delivering the programme and improving the system. The Government has made significant changes to the leadership and governance of the programme, improving the transparency of decision-making and increasing the strategic capacity of senior management. 
However, it's clear that the difficulties experienced in previous years have had a detrimental impact on the programme over the last year. The report highlights that significant management time is still focused on short-term payment priorities. The changes to leadership will take time to embed, and the government will need to ensure that senior management are able to focus on the longer-term strategic needs of the directorate. I highlight in my report that the application process has improved, with the proportion of applications made online increasing. But the government has not been able to make 2016 payments as quickly as it would have liked. The system required significant development to be able to make 2016 payments, and the government undertook additional checks to make sure there were no errors. In order to make payments to farmers more quickly, the government introduced another loan scheme. This made payments to, to farmers from November 2016, which was welcomed, but it put the government's budget under pressure, and the requirement to maximise the recovery of loans by the year end put pressure on payment timescales and on staff. The report also summarises the findings of our recent audit work on the European Agricultural Funds account. We identify through that audit a number of weaknesses in controls, which mean that there continues to be a risk of significant financial penalties. I recommended in my report last May that the government should complete a detailed assessment of the risk of financial penalties, and I highlight this year that the assessment is not yet complete. In the absence of the government's own assessment and acknowledging the uncertainties involved, we've updated our estimate and found that penalties of up to £60 million are still possible. The programme closed at the end of March this year, with programme activity moving into the business of the directorate. Three key systems are still being developed. The programme had spent £166 million to the end of March 2017, and the government forecasts that it will deliver a CAP compliance system within the budget of £178 million. The government will need to continue to incur costs related to the rural payment system. An independent technical assurance review found that although the system's design and infrastructure was fundamentally sound, significant investment will be needed to develop, rewrite and redesign some parts of it. The review also noted the lack of a fully, fully tested comprehensive disaster recovery plan. Overall, the report highlights that the programme has cost significantly more than expected, delivered less than originally anticipated, and will not deliver the full range of planned benefits. To date, it hasn't delivered value for money. My report makes a number of recommendations to help management prioritise activity as the programme closes and moves into directorate activity. Convener, I have with me the team who've worked on this report and on previous reports, and we'll do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much. Um, before I invite members to ask questions, um, you referred to the Independent Technical Assurance Review of the IT system in your statement to us um, that was commissioned by the Scottish Government. Um, you'll be aware that we asked the Scottish Government to provide a full version of the review, but it had concerns around commercial confidentiality and the possibility of cyber attacks. Um, so they didn't want to publish that. They have, however, provided us with a summary of the key findings. Um, given that it concerns an IT programme which you know, has meant multi-million pounds um, of, prod of public money which has been beset by delays, I would like to be reassured that you as the Auditor General um, had access to all the information and weren't inhibited in carrying out your report. Absolutely. Um, I've had access to all of the information I require to produce this report. Um, I've read the Technical Assurance Review in full, and I know my team um, have worked with it closely in informing the conclusions in my report. That's helpful to know. Thank you very much. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Well, General, I suppose the, the biggest concern here is the, the potential for disallowance and uh, the, the risks around that. Now, you say you've done a detailed assessment. What does that entail? Um, I'll ask the team to talk you through the, the detail of it in a moment. I think it's worth um, saying up front um, that uh, the recommendation I made last year was that the government should carry out that assessment itself in order to prioritise its own investment in which parts of the system should take priority to minimise the risk of penalties and disallowance. That work is still continuing and the government doesn't have its own figure. Um, we uh, made use of the information to which I've just referred in my answer to the convener and our knowledge of the, East, the European Com Commission's rules to carry out our own assessment in relation to both delayed payments and the controls that are required to be in place. And I think Morag's probably best place to talk you through how we did that. 
Yes, yeah, so um, first, just to set out that the financial penalties that can be incurred obviously relate to not just missing de deadlines, but also um, if we identify any weaknesses in controls, um, if, if that poses a risk to the, the European funding. Um, there is within the EC regulations a, a, an audit circular which sets out a table which um, has a percentage that can be applied in terms of disallowance from about 2% um, up, right up to 25%, and that goes on the, the number um, of uh, control weaknesses that are identified. As we set out um, in paragraphs 57 to uh, 64 of the reports, uh, that sets out what we found in the European Agricultural Funds audit that identified a number of weaknesses in control. And from that, we used that information to then um, refine our assessment from previous years. Our assess assessment also takes into consideration um, missing deadlines as well. Okay. Um, now, you've adjusted your potential loss from 125 million to 60 million. Was that, wh why was that adjustment made? Was there improvements in the system or? better controls? Last year we gave a range. Um, our estimate was between 40 million and 125 million um, and that assessment was prepared um, in advance of the publication of the report last May 2016. Um, after that the government obviously applied for or was granted an extension to the payment deadline from the end of June to the middle of October and that affected um, the likely penalties and disallowance that come through. Um, it's also fair to say as the report says between paragraphs 56 and 60 that actually in the um, European Agricultural Funds audit, um, we found that some of the weaknesses had increased from previous audit work. So it's a complex calculus, as Morag's tried to talk you through. Um, but the combination of all of that brings the upper limit down from 125 million to 60, um, with a recognition of the uncertainties that are involved, and indeed the fact that if the um, EC does decide to impose penalties, the government can negotiate with the Commission about that. I suppose the thing that comes to mind is, I mean, I'm not defending this, this system. It's clearly been a real problem. But last year, when presumably things were even worse than they are this year, the penalties incurred were five million. I would have hoped that it would be getting mitigated in some way. We, we hope they're being mitigated as well, and I, I guess that's reflected in the fact that the upper limit has come down in the estimate that we've published in this report. The five million um, relates only to payment delays, um, and as the team has talked you through, there is also the potential for significant penalties relating to control weaknesses, um, and we know those weaknesses exist from our work on the um, European Agricultural Funds audit. It's for the EC to assess what penalties it wishes to impose, and the government can negotiate but there is a second stream of potential penalties as well as those related to delayed payments. So, so the, the, the control issues, are they, from, from your experience, from what you've seen, are they improving? Are they being addressed? Morag, Stephen, do you want to talk that through in more detail? At paragraph 60 of the report, we give a, a flavour of the, some of the control difficulties we encountered uh, during the course of the EFA audit, um, which was quite a challenging audit, and we concluded that at the at the end of February. In terms of some of the, the difficulties to overcome, it's really the, the availability of the audit trail, the system reports to support the numbers um, in the, the EFA account. Um, and whilst you know, the, the nature of potential disallowances um, has reduced, in terms of at the experience during the course of the audit and some of the um, challenges that we found in terms of the, the evidence to support the numbers, um, it was a difficult experience. So whilst um, the overall account, the, you know, we were able to verify the numbers that, that were produced um, for us to audit. We still make recommendations and, and note findings uh, to be addressed uh, during the course and, and, and information that will follow up during the course of the audit this year. Now, John, you said the system is working. Um, perhaps not working as well as it should, but it, it is working and it is delivering. You've stated that it's not value for money. And uh, on the face of it, I can understand why you might go down that road. I was just wondering, though, given the potential of a disallowance which might have taken place had even this system not been in place, it's obviously delivering some value for money, if not as much as might be a hope for. Would that be correct? 
Um, I've said that the system has not yet achieved value for money, and that recognises the fact that the government is still hoping that it can um, identify more areas to achieve benefits from the investment that it has made um, around, for example, the land mapping system and the customer account information, which, which is being developed and will, we hope, be in place in future. Um, the reason, though, for my judgment that it hasn't yet received achieved value for money is very much about the comparison of the original costs and benefits that were anticipated against where we are now. So we've seen the cost rise from the original planned costs of about 102 million to 178 million as the current estimate. And we know that some of the planned benefits on which that was based have, been, have not been achieved. First of all, obviously, the risk uh, of um, minimising uh, penalties and disallowance is still very much open. Some of the benefits in terms of integrating Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 payments, an improved experience for users and customers of the system, um, and improved reporting haven't been were taken out of scope deliberately when the system was rescoped in 2015. Um, and we still have some elements which will need further investment to achieve future CAP compliance. So at, at the moment, all of those elements together drew me to conclude that it hasn't yet achieved value for money, and I recognise that the government is still working to see what more value it can achieve achieve from the system. Team, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, so, first of all, just to get into this, you made four recommendations uh, in the previous report, uh, but only one of them has been completed. Uh, so, when do you anticipate, when are the government saying the rest of them will be acknowledged and achieved? Um, I think that um, we can give you some more detail on the government's current plans for some of the three uh, recommendations which are not yet complete. Um, the comments I would make, though, I think reflects the comments in my opening statement, which is that the focus on being able to um, open the applications process and make payments during 2017 um, has got in the way of the longer-term strategic um, changes that are needed to um, make the programme as a whole as robust and resilient as it may be. Gemma, is there more that we can add about progress? Certainly. So on the other three recommendations, um, there is very much work in progress on, on these issues, um, and we wanted to recognise that while recognising that further effort is still required on them. For example, the first one on the kind of detailed assessment of financial penalties. We made that recommendation last year, as your General said, to kind of help them to make the decisions on priorities. We note now that the they have the changes to governance that have been made does bring in some of the accreditation side to sit on those committees that helps that broader assessment of all the issues, but that more detailed assessment of actually what is the risk, what is the built-up risk of financial penalties across all the different schemes has not yet been done. So while some um, changes have been made to look more broadly at um, the risk of disallowance, it's not been to that detailed level that we would expect it to be. We also talk about um, knowledge transfer um, and that's very much a live issue at the moment with the end of the programme and contractors leaving. We have seen a, a transition plan in place, but the risk for it that we saw was that there's so much activity ongoing at the moment with the need to make payments and the need to deliver the developments to the system that there's very much a risk that there's not that time built in for that noise transfer to, to take place. And we thought there's not actually adequate contingency in there to allow for that. So we were thinking because of that risk that that, that plan um, might not succeed and we wanted to highlight that risk. Our last one was around about the disaster recovery solution. We noted that last year and again it's come up in the independent technical assurance report as well. Um, largely um, the situation hasn't moved up on that much but the Scottish Government are starting to consider now with the legacy systems being in place for much longer which is where the real problem lies with the disaster recovery the new system does have a disaster recovery built into it. It hasn't yet been tested, but it is there. But the legacy systems cause the problem because they're having to rely on those legacy systems for much longer. They're now looking at actually, um, as we kind of suggested, what is the risk that they're prepared to, um, prepared to take at different parts of the process and therefore what would be appropriate disaster recovery arrangements to put in place in the short term and into the longer term. So uh, can we look at the knowledge transfer piece? That you mentioned. Uh, first of all, just for my clarity, you talk at uh, 94, paragraph 94 in, in your report, and you mentioned something else there uh, about contractors 
Uh, there are around 20 contractors with a pivotal role, uh, and you say in paragraph 94, a significant number of contractors developing the system. Just for my clarity, when you say contractors, what you mean is uh, like your, your classic IR35 one-man band engaged to, to send one guy in to develop something. Is that correct? No, these are contractors that the majority of contractors come through the main supplier, so come through CGI, and that's what we mean by contractors. So they're contractors employed by CGI or, or through CGI. Engaged through CGI, yes. not employed by CGI. Yes, sorry. I understand. Uh, interesting. So you then talk about the knowledge transfer, uh, and this is a program whereby now there's a system there, we're trying to capture all of that knowledge to get it internalised to employees to actually put in place, correct? Yes, so essentially as the programme closes and there will be less people working on the development of the system, it's very, it's essential that that knowledge is transferred to the staff who will be running the business as it goes into business as usual, who know and understand how the system operates. And is there any, have you been given any idea of when that process will conclude? And indeed how it will conclude, because presumably, as you, as you quite rightly say, there are a finite number of staff in there already who are, by the sound of it, incredibly overworked and are about to have an enormous amount of knowledge transfer placed on them. Is that correct? So we know that arrangements are already in place. So for some of those very key roles, there's been work shadowing put in place over the last few months to try and get that knowledge transfer um, in place. So we know it is very much on the Scottish Government's kind of top of their priority list is something that they need to do, and arrangements are in place um, for that. Should the Scottish Government be engaging or employing more people? Should, is that an exercise that's happening? So one of the things that the, the um, directorate has been doing is looking at the kind of capacity that it has within the directorate um, to manage um, the move into business as usual. We've, we talk in the report about um, leadership changes and the kind of increases in, into the leadership team to make sure that it has that capacity to deal with the business as usual as the system comes out of development and, and, and into normal processes. Convener, I have some further questions, but I think okay. I'll come back later. Willie Coffey. Thanks, Convener. I wonder if I could just uh, go back to the, the budgetary issues and try and steer away from the software issues that are usually focus on in this discussion. Um, Auditor General, in the opening second paragraph, you're saying there that the government expects to deliver the system that complies with CAP regulations within the £170 million budget. And we discussed it there in response to some of Colin Beattie's questions. Could, could you say what your perspective is on that, if you've had a chance to look at that? And you were, you're also projecting forward looking at some additional work that may continue to be required to fully develop, test and so on and deliver the system. Has there been any analysis of the extent <coughs> and the size of that and whether Audit Scotland has had a chance to scrutinise that too? Um, yes, uh, if I can refer you first of all to Exhibit 7 on page 18, um, that shows you the uh, programme costs as at the 31st of March. Um, so it shows you that of the total £178 million budget, £166.4 million had been spent by that point. Um, and the remaining, the balance of the £178 million was committed to a range of other um, things which need to be achieved to um, ensure CAP compliance at that point. Um, most significantly, there are three additional parts of the system which still need to be uh, put in place and which are budgeted for um, in relation to the uh, scheme accounting and customer um, account management, to the land parcel and pillar two uh, capital claims. So those are budgeted for, um, and the uh, budgeting we think is reasonable, but there is clearly a risk until that those parts of the system are up and running, that they may cost more than expected, or that there may be unanticipated problems with them. So that's the £178 million programme budget. Mm -hmm. Moving on a little bit in the report, we identify that um, the Scottish Government, in order to um, not just maintain the system but develop and stabilise the elements which are already in place, has entered into contracts with two suppliers, um, a contract of £29 million with CGI over two years, which reflects their option to extend that payment, um, and a smaller contract of um, £3.5 million uh, to... Uh, uh, maintain and develop some of the legacy systems to keep it together. Um, 
we recognise in the report that there is always a need to invest in maintaining and continuing to develop an IT system to make sure it stays fit for purpose and can meet changing needs. But we also conclude that the scale of the investment requ required is more than would normally be anticipated. Um, and I think that reflects the findings in the Technical Assurance Review. Gemma, do you want to add to that in terms of any of the detail? Um, so we know at the moment, from the obviously the Technical Assurance Review um, indicates that significant investment is required. What we don't know yet is what the what the costs of that will be. That, that the Scottish Government are currently talking with the contractors about what the cost might, of that might be and how significant they will be. I think what is clear is that there will be um, a number of decisions for the, the Government to make about where they prioritise the investment. And that's why we made the recommendation in the report about them having a framework in place to allow them to make those decisions, so to ensure that they bring in what are the technical requirements of the system, but what are the requirements from some of the EC audits, for example, and how do they prioritise investment in that? What do the farmers want to be prioritised? What do the area offices staff need? So there has to be a framework which brings all those things together so that the Scottish Government can prioritise between them about where the, the investment goes. How, I mean, how regular will this be, the, the follow-up assessment and projection of continuing financial support to develop the system? Because it's, it's clearly obvious that any package like this is going to need continuing maintenance and possibly some, some investment as, as policies change and demands change. So how regularly will we see that, do you think? You know, a re-forecast of what will additionally be required year on year to support the, the package? What the directorate will need to do will be in annually as part of its budgeting process to look at actually what are the needs for that year um, and the next year, um, as, as it would do in, in, in any year, and it will now, as it is now long, no longer a programme, it is part of business as usual. That will form part of its overall assessment about what it needs, what um, investment might be required, and where are the priority areas, and how will it spread that over um, the years. A, a reference in the paper as well, Auditor General, in paragraph 19, I think, is due to difficulties experienced across Europe. Have, have other jurisdictions? been experiencing diff similar difficulties in implementing the new CAP system in their, their countries and what kind of extent of it have they had to, to contend with? We know that a number of member states had difficulties last year um, in meeting the uh, end of June timescale for making payments um, and the Commission as a result um, gave a wider extension to a number of member states to extend the uh, deadline through to October, mid-October 2016. Um, we don't know what the position is this year. Um, I don't think we're in a position to comment about um, practice elsewhere in the, in the uh, European com community at the moment, um, but we do know that it was widespread last year. And th thanks for that. And beyond 2019, perhaps, when, when the UK pulls out the European Union, this software's presumably going to have to change radically at that point again, because the compliance rules are, are going to be changed or different, I would imagine. None of us knows what the position <laughs> will look like in 2019. I assume the government will still um, want to be developing a system for providing support to the rural economy. Um, and I think one of the areas that the directorate is currently looking at is um, how this system could be used to provide wider support uh, with further development um, as required. But it's obviously not a helpful development in, in the terms of providing what's required for this CAP programme. I presume it will, it will stay in place until we know what it should be replaced by, but Indeed. So this, this system should Indeed. have some kind of lifespan even beyond exiting. One the would area. hope for the amount of money so, we've put in it, it has yeah. more than just a limited shelf life. Liam, care for one final question and then we'll move on. One. Well, you might want to make it one in parts. OK. Uh, very quick questions. So, uh, two contracts have been extended. Uh, I think CGI and uh, paragraph 43 say another one has been extended. Uh, do you have any comment on the extension of the contracts of people who appear to have failed to deliver the IT system that they're paid to do? Um, secondly, on the loan scheme, which I'm very pleased about, this is people's lives that we're talking about here, but money was pulled into the loan scheme. What has suffered as a result of funding the loan scheme? And finally, who is at fault for this? Um, Perfectly succinct. Auditor uh, General. Thank you. Um, 
we, we talk uh, in some detail about the extension of the contracts in uh, paragraphs 40 to 43. Um, I think in terms of CGI, the option to extend the contract was there from the beginning for two years, um, and I think given the problems that have been experienced, um, there was little option once the government started to look at what was required other than to extend it. We do recognise in the report um, that the um, government has negotiated um, quite rigorously with CGI about the conditions that are put in place around uh, that extension and that contract monitoring has improved. Um, and I think that gives me some comfort um, that this is being done in a way which um, is based on a proper appraisal of the options and um, maximises the chance of getting good value for the additional money that's being spent. Um, the other contract is a smaller one and reflects the fact that um, against expectations, the rural payment system overall is still relying on a number of legacy systems which need to be maintained in order to play their part in that. Um, so against uh, the point which the system has reached, they both seem to me to be reasonable decisions. I'll ask Stephen to pick up the question of loans. Thank you. Um, at kind of, I refer Mr Carr to Exhibit 4 in the report where we set out um, in a bit more detail the progress and use of the loan schemes um, over the course of the past few years, really covering the various uh, mechanisms that have been used, as well as the recovery and, and the amounts outstanding. Um, the government has funded the loan schemes from its uh, financial transactions budget, and that is a budget that's designed to, to fund schemes outside public sector bodies, uh, typically for uh, regeneration infrastructure <coughs> um, and housing initiatives. And, uh, and what we've uh, said in, in terms of the, um, there was a, an impetus to, uh, to recover uh, balances of loans um, uh, by the year end, and we note the balance that, that remained outstanding um, at the year end. The government has noted that um, it was uh, able to support and deliver the, the programme through um, what is referred to as underspends um, in other areas um, to, to arrive at, at the year end position. Right. And who's at fault? I'll pick that one up again if I may, Convener. Um, the committee may recall that in my report last year, I concluded that the problems we've seen with this system go right back to the beginnings of the programme in 2012, um, and the extent to which the complexity of the new CAP programme was underestimated, and beyond that, the um, changes that were agreed between the Scottish Government and farmers and rural businesses added to that complexity. Um, we have seen significant changes in the, um, both the civil servants and the uh, ministers accountable for this um, in recent months. Um, but I think the question of the underlying responsibility goes right back to 2012, um, and we can refer you back to that earlier report if you would find that helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'll have a brief suspension to allow some of the witnesses to change. which is Scotland's Colleges 26, 2017, indeed. Um, so we'll take evidence on the report from the Auditor-General, and I welcome back the Auditor-General and her two colleagues from Audit Scotland, and could I invite her to give us an opening statement? Thank you, Convener. The second report this morning is my annual report on Scotland's Colleges. Um, colleges have an important role in helping to achieve sustainable economic growth by contributing to the development of a highly educated and skilled workforce. The college sector has been through major reform in recent years, and I've, I've reported to this committee and its predecessor um, about progress through my annual overview reports. Today's report provides an update on college finances as well as an analysis of learning activity. Since 2012-13, the Scottish Government has set a national target for the college sector to, to deliver a certain volume of learning. The sector has continued to exceed this target, although its performance declined slightly in the last year. The Government prioritises full-time courses for younger learners. With the number of young people in Scotland falling at the moment, and school leavers increasingly going into employment or university, 
We think it will be harder for the sector to continue achieving the national target in future. We illustrate this in Exhibit 1 on page 9 of the report. There are over 220,000 students in colleges across Scotland in 2015-16. The number of students attending college has fallen slightly since last year, and when measured by full-time equivalents, numbers are at their lowest level since 2006-07. Most of the reductions are in the 16-24 to 24 age group. The change in student numbers is shown in Exhibits 2 and 3 on pages 10 and 11 of the report. Because overall demand for college places is still not recorded, we're not able to say whether this reflects a fall in demand um, or other factors. Looking at how well students do in college, attainment continues to improve, with the percentage of full-time students who successfully complete their course increasing in 2015-16. Most full-time students also continue to be satisfied with their college experience. In terms of the financial health of the college sector, we note that it remains stable, but that it has deteriorated since 2014-15. We analysed college accounts and found that 11 had an underlying deficit, compared to 9 in the previous year. Overall, the sector's underlying deficit was £8 million in 2015-16, compared to a £1 million in the previous year. Colleges will, increase an incre colleges will receive an increase in funding from the Scottish Government in 2017-18, but they will still face some financial challenges. In particular, Colleges Scotland has estimated that meeting the costs arising from implementing any agreements from national pay and conditions negotiations could be around £80 million over three years. The Government is still working to verify these figures. Some colleges have started to develop longer-term financial plans, and work is underway with the Funding Council to establish a common set of assumptions to underpin these. This will help to support financial decision-making that takes account of both immediate and future cost pressures. The report makes a number of recommendations for the Government, the Funding Council and individual colleges to take forward, and these are summarised on page 6 of the report. College I'm convener, I'm joined by Mark McPherson and Stuart Nugent, who carried out the work for this audit, and we're happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Auditor General. Colin Peasy. Thank you, Convener. Um, Auditor General, there's mention made here of uh, five colleges in particular that have deficits. Now, some of them we've seen come before us as an issue before, but there are some new names in there. Should we be concerned? Um, we talk about four colleges facing uh, particular challenges to their financial sustainability. Um, three of them are the ones which you've received Section 22 reports on um, in this uh, year of the Parliament. Uh, the other is New College Lanarkshire, which is um, summarised in Exhibit um, 8 of the report. Um, I made the decision um, at the point where Section 22 reports were being um, drawn together that it wasn't appropriate at that stage to bring you a Section 22 report on that one college, but we are monitoring it closely, um, and you may see further reporting in future depending on what's happened during the, the financial year that's about to close. I think on rereading, I'm talking about uh, regional Dumfries and Galloway, which oh, failed to apologies. meet the targets as well. Can you refer me to the paragraph you're oh, looking at? Oh, it's paragraph Peter? 8. Paragraph 8. Page Apologies, nine. yes, you're talking about the targets for student numbers rather yeah, than the, yeah. the targets for um, financial performance. Um, we, we um, I think, don't have particular concerns about what's happening in the areas that haven't been reported to you individually already, um, but the assurance holds that through the auditors and through the work that the team in Audit Scotland do, we monitor it closely, and if we think there are underlying problems that aren't being addressed, we will report them to you in, in good time. I note you refer to a 6% increase in staff numbers over the last couple of years. That seems... Well, a little bit extraordinary, given that uh, all the colleges are saying that they're going to be saving money and reaching their budgets by reducing staff, which are the most expensive element. Are these frontline staff, or it, it, it just seems odd? It's our attention as well, as you can imagine. More information is set out in paragraphs 42 and 43, um, which provides more information about both non-teaching staff and teaching staff. Um, the number of non-teaching staff has increased by 9% since 2013-14, um, and colleges where that happened uh, told us that the main reasons were services such as catering and cleaning being brought back in-house, um, curriculum changes which require more support staff, um, or um, more apprenticeships where uh, apprentices are being brought on as members of non-teaching college staff. 
Um, in relation to teaching staff, the numbers increased by uh, 5% since 2013-14. That's shown in paragraph 43. Um, again, colleges tell us that that's due to um, increasing credit targets in some colleges um, and changes in curriculum or service delivery. And you heard some of that in your evidence from Edinburgh College earlier. Um, it's obviously an area we're looking at closely, given the reduction in staffing numbers we saw during the, the peak period of reform. Um, and we have recommended that colleges should be putting in place detailed workforce plans so that they, they're able to plan for the longer term rather than making short-term decisions that may have longer-term costs and consequences. Mark, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. No, uh, nothing, nothing to add. Down. Thank you. And references made to reduction in the amount of money held in ALFs. Um, I assume this is what you would have expected to see in any case, because I think most of that money was originally allocated, particularly for CapEx projects. Did, did you look at this at all? I know there's been this question of how far you can look at an ALF. Absolutely. We look at it, as you know, through the lens of the college accounts, rather than looking directly at the arm's length foundations themselves. Stuart, do you want to talk about what we've seen in, in doing that work? Yes, I think um, I think we've reported on it. Um, yeah, we've got that. Yes, in paragraph 60, um, we reported our findings. Um, so we noted in 2014 there was 99 million um, was donated to ALFs from the college sector. Um, over the course of the last or the previous the two years following that, um, the current the current amount held is around 57 million pounds, um, and colleges are forecasting that they will require a further 34 million from ALFs, mainly for capital projects in the years from 2016-17 to 2018-19. That, um, given the range of uh, pressures that colleges are facing, we think it's unlikely that they'll be able to transfer significant amounts back into the foundations, but that may change over a period of time, um, and it's something we'd expect to see reflected in their longer-term financial plans as they're developed. But there's no indication that they're removing the funds from ALFs for revenue purposes? Um, the terms of the ALFs should preclude that in any case, um, but certainly the um, examples that we've looked at and refer to here in the paragraph that Stuart's just referred to are uh, generally for capital purposes. Okay. On page six, you say here the S SFC should conclude its work too, and you're talking about uh, requiring colleges to include the underlying financial position. Is that in respect to depreciation? Uh, Stuart is our expert in all of these um, accounting adjustments that are made, and I'll ask him to talk you through the significant elements. Depreciation is one of them. Yes, indeed. Depreciation is one of them. Um, others are uh, pension adjustments, um, which reflect longer-term um, implications from um, pension liabilities for the, the college sector. Um, there's also adjustments for any uh, asset impairments, which um, don't, don't result in a, an immediate cash payment, but again may impact on a longer term basis. Um, and this year we've also noted that um, due to a change in the accounting rules, um, capital income from ALFs has been recognised in full in year, whereas in the past it would be recognised um, over the course of the, the asset to which it would be um, it, it was it, it was funded for. Um, so we've, we've made an adjustment for that because otherwise the, the income doesn't match against the expenditure. So that, that's the main uh, adjustments that, that we made this year. Um, but we recommend that the, the Scottish Funding Council should um, identify the main adjustments um, along the same lines as ourselves um, and uh, require colleges to include a, a statement within the accounts um, of the underlying position. Is this first, the first time that this has been done? Uh, no, we did a similar exercise last year. Um, the only difference being that the, the capital income from ALFs um, is a, a new adjustment brought about by the new SORP, which came in in 1516. Okay, so has the SFC accepted this recommendation? Yeah, yes, yes, it has. Uh, um, yes, in fact, I, I think that, as we, as we mentioned in the, the report, we uh, recommend that the SFC should conclude its work to. Um, specify the adjustments so that they, are, they have taken the point on board uh, and as far as I'm aware it will be included within the accounts direction for 2016-17 although I haven't had sight of that yet I think that should be available shortly. Going back to this question of the depreciation which has always been a bit of a nodity um, you've obviously in your calculations in the report here you've, you've allowed for that for the, for the college sector I understand there's going to be changes to this Will it eliminate the need for these adjustments? Um, 
No, um, I don't. I, I don't think. They, but well, we haven't seen the detail in terms of how it will look in the accounts. But I, I don't think it, it will eliminate the need for an adjustment as such. Um, the the proposal from the funding council is to allocate a fixed cash budget to each of the colleges. Um, so that that will the, the, well, there is a, first of all a name change from net depreciation to fixed cash budget. It's effectively the same thing. Um, each college will know in advance um, how much. Um, of uh, fixed cash it will have available and what it can spend that cash on. So that should work towards um, providing colleges with more certainty. Um, but by spending that cash, it will still have an impact on the, the, def or the surplus or deficit position in the accounts. And so um, it will still require an adjustment of some sort um, within the accounts. OK, so eliminating the depreciation and bringing in this f fixed cash budget, uh, it's not really achieving much, is it? It's just, it's end of the day, it's, it's coming to the same thing. I think what it's doing is maintaining the funding available to colleges through the changes that re were required when they were reclassified as public bodies. Um, it is complex, as you can hear from the very detailed information that Stuart's been providing the committee with. Um, and I, I think the, the general conclusion is that there isn't a, a solution to the underlying issue brought about by reclassification. We're focusing instead on transparency, on making sure that colleges report on a consistent basis um, how they've spent the resources available to them and that we can look at the underlying financial position as a result of that. Okay. Thank you. Can I move on to Monica Lennon? I'm conscious of time, but Monica, on you go. Thank you, convener. I guess one of the, the headlines from the report um, is it should numbers decrease slightly in 15-16, but are at their lowest since 2006-2007. Um, there's been a lot of reaction to, to the report and to, to the figures, um, but I wondered, wondered if, General, if you can provide some clarification, because when this was raised with the First Minister at First Minister's questions last week, she did not accept the methodology that's been used in the report, and I think she said those statistics come from the Funding Council and we don't agree with the methodology. Can you help explain what's going on here? Uh, of course. Um, I think the first thing to say is that for all of our reports, we go through a process of agreeing the factual accuracy with the bodies that we're auditing. And in this case, that includes the Funding Council and the Scottish Government. Um, my report focuses on the 20 incorporated colleges, which are the ones that fall within my remit. And that's been the case since I started producing these reports some years ago. If I can refer you to paragraph 12, um, it provides some background to the, the confusion that I think you've just um, highlighted. Um, so the figures that um, I, I quote in my key messages and throughout the report are based on those 20 incorporated colleges. If you add in um, the uh, non-incorporated colleges, of which there are six, uh, plus Scottish, Scotland's Rural College, which is a higher education institution whose activity counts towards the further education target, um, you end up with a very small um, increase in headcount in 2015-16, but the overall trend is, is still the same over, over time. Um, so we've tried to be as transparent as we can about what is happening here, um, but the exhibits in uh, Exhibit 2 and uh, exhibit one, I think, highlight the um, overall message, which is not so much about student numbers in 2015-16, but about the long-term trend with uh, the focus on younger students studying full-time courses that lead to a recognised qualification, which is a matter of government policy, um, and secondly, the declining number of young people in that age group and the fact that more of them are going to um, employment and higher education rather, rather than into further education college. So... The, the figures I um, have reported are transparent and I stand by them, um, but that's actually not the key message. The message is about the longer term policy and the extent to which targets will be achievable given that demographic shift that we're seeing. Well, that's helpful clarification. Um, in terms of what the, the, the trends are, are telling us, um, I suppose that takes me on to look at actual demand. So, again, in your report, um, there's a lot of... Um, discussion around the fact that, you know, we don't really know what the demand is. So I know that you did recommend last year that the Funding Council should explore with colleges a way to better assess that demand. Um, I think you're saying the Scottish Government is now commencing some work on this. Um, I don't know if that would be like a common application process perhaps around like, the UCAS system we have for universities. Is that what you're recommending and is that what government are actually committed to exploring? 
Yes, um, you're, you're right to reference the higher education system where across uh, the United Kingdom we know how many students are applying for higher education places. We don't have that for further education um, and for further education in Scotland. So it's not clear whether the, the falling numbers we're seeing over time reflect either a fall in demand or students who aren't able to access the course that they would, would like to, to study. Um, Mark, I think, can talk you through more what the government and the funding council are doing around looking at a system to, to fill that gap in the data. Yeah, so the, the funding council and the government have looked in the past at ways in which they can better understand some of the demand and uh, for college places. I think the SFC, Scottish Funding Council, does have a demographic model, so they do look at some of the wider implications of demographic change. But more recently, as part of, I understand, it, the learner journey work that the Scottish government is, is undertaking, uh, they're looking specifically at the, the, the potential in a common application process. So at this stage, that's still at a very early stage. Can I pick up on retention rates? Again, they decrease slightly for 2015-2016. Um, I know there's some work underway to try and better understand the reasons why people are dropping out. I know Annette Bruton in the previous session ran through some of them. Um, but again, are, are we getting a a complete picture here of what's what's going on? The information that um, we've used is set out in paragraph 25, and we do have information that splits between um, further education students full-time and part-time and uh, higher education students in, in further education colleges, which is part of the complexity we were talking about a moment ago. Um, and it's a mixed picture, and the changes are very small year on year. Um, at a national level, I think it's very hard to explain what's happening. Um, the Funding Council, as we say in that paragraph, um, thinks that one of the reasons may be the efforts that colleges are making uh, to target harder to reach students who may need more support to be able to remain in their course and to benefit from them. But that is an impressionistic view rather than based on the data. Um, I was very encouraged to hear what Annette Bruton was saying about the work that Edinburgh is doing to identify students who are having difficulties early and to see what can be done to support them. Uh, it clearly also links into questions about the availability of student support funding, um, other services to help students who have particular needs to, to benefit from their courses and I think that can only be done at a, a college by college level. Um, I mean again I think just from speaking to, to students and lecturers recently it's not always a negative when a student does withdraw from a course it could be that they've managed to get a place at university or another opportunity has arisen but I guess the, the point is that we really don't know what the, the picture is telling us. Um, the other question I suppose had was around you know the the financial cost if a student does withdraw from a, a, a course early on, has any work been done to, to look at that in terms of what that's that's costing the public and um, you know, could we you know improve on that? It's not work that we've done. Um, we do note in the report, though, that in March this year, the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science outlined some work that the government is doing um, to try to improve attainment and uh, retention rates in colleges. And I hope that that would be looking at those sorts of questions to really understand the costs and benefits to individual students, but also to colleges and the sector as a whole, and think about how best to improve that. Lastly, can if I just can... Um pick up the issue of national bargaining because it's it's been discussed earlier but we know that I think College Scotland are, are estimating around £80 million pounds will be required to cover the, the, the full cost of implementing um, you know, national pay and conditions. Um, it sounds like in some colleges it's coming as a bit of a surprise and they haven't really factored it in but I note from the, the point that Colin Beattie made or I think you touched on about New College Lanarkshire, that seems to be a factor in some of the financial pressures that they're facing and have flagged up. So um, do you have any sense of um, how prepared colleges are to meet these costs? Is that figure of 80 million, is it accurate? And I know the, the Scottish Funding Council have made some additional money available um, in recent weeks, but I think it's only around £2 million. Um, so this extra 80 million, if that is the correct figure, where is that money going to come from and can colleges absorb that and based on their, their current budgets? 
We highlight it as being one of the most significant financial pressures that colleges are facing. Um, the £80 million is only an estimate at this stage, and one of, the the, one of the difficulties is that we know it will affect different colleges in different ways, because they have all negotiated their paying conditions separately. They're starting in different places. Some are closer to what the national package looks like, and some are further away, and that will um, need to be built up almost on the basis of individual members of staff to, to understand what the financial implications are. I think Mark can tell you a bit more about the work that's going on behind the scenes to understand that and the scale of the challenge. Well, I understand that Colleges Scotland, as uh, the representative body for colleges, has been working pretty closely with colleges to try and establish individual costs at each college based on their best understanding of what the, the final costs are likely to be. That's subject to ongoing discussion, as you would expect, with both the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Government, because there will be a question about where the funding might come from if it's needed to uh, meet that cost. So just to clarify that figure of 80 million that Colleges Scotland have arrived at, is that based on information that they're getting from the individual colleges? I understand that since the time that I estimate they've been doing further work with colleges and so the figure has been refined over time. We don't have the, the detail on, on what that is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Uh, could you just remind us, Auditor General, how much cash assets does the, the college sector currently have? Cash assets. Cash assets, yep. um, the cash that they held at the end of the financial year had fallen um, between 2014 and 15 and 2016 um, from uh, it had fallen by 11 million pounds. Um, the amount that's held, I think Stuart will be able to help me with. Yeah, um, 43 million pounds in the 15 16 accounts. So that, that's their cash asset at the moment. Is there any restrictions about the use of that? Is it, is it for identified purposes? And res, you know, or no, that, would, that's, can they that's use cash it on hand. So that's to meet hand. their um, ongoing costs of, of running the services that they're responsible for. Right. OK, thanks very much for uh, clarifying that. So in terms of the population changes, um, I note from your paper in paragraph 7 that since 2012-13, the Scottish Government's maintained this figure of 116,000 FTE student places and still maintains that, but that, that's despite quite a significant drop in the actual population from that period, particularly in the 16 to 19 year old age group, as well as reporting that more youngsters are going into work and or university. So you could interpret that, that, that's a really positive message, I think, but how are the colleges looking at this? Because that, that's a clear message is in here for the future, if there is a declining population uh, and how they prepare for the, for the years to come on the assumption that that, that FTE target will be maintained. You're right. The first of my key messages is that the colleges, has man the colleges have managed to continue to achieve their learning targets um, over a number of years now in the face of the challenges we have there. And Exhibit 1 shows you the learning targets um, achieved in the past and forecast for the next couple of years against the population of young people. And that, that gap starts to look more significant as we look to the future. That's why we're making the recommendation, first of all, that the target itself should be reviewed, given that there are fewer young people and more of them are going in into work or into higher education, is the target itself still appropriate? And then um, individual colleges, um, through the reform process and through the curriculum reviews that they're carrying out, are looking at how best they can serve the needs of the young people in their area. But in a sense, you need both that top-down and that bottom-up look to, to be able to um, make an assessment of whether the system itself is, is trying to do the right things for the longer term. How are they managing to maintain the targets if the actual physical numbers and the population are declining and therefore coming through to the colleges. How do you imagine to do that? Um, Mark, more courses yeah. than Mark may want to comment. I think we have seen curriculum reviews happening after reform, which have aimed to understand better what the needs of employers and young people themselves are, and to make sure those courses are being delivered. Um, looking at more innovative ways of providing further education, um, more options for learning. There's, there's good work going on behind this, and it clearly is becoming more difficult against the demographic change and the financial pressures that we reported on. Mark, is there more you can say? Yeah, just to say, I suppose we mentioned earlier the lack of any national measure of demand, and it could be that some of the, the achievement of continued achievement of targets is tapping into markets of population that previously weren't attending or weren't coming to college. We've also mentioned harder to reach students, and it could be that with additional support or additional input to those students, more people could be attracted into college from the what's the smaller pool that now exists. Okay, we have time for one last one. And Very brief. So in Europe again, it's in paragraph 54. You mention a number of schemes there uh, that are funded through the European Union to the value of 70 
million pounds, but these programmes are are scheduled to end anyway in 2020-21. I, I think has there been any discussion about further extending these beyond that period of time? And I know the UK government's given some kind of commitment to 2020, but we don't think there's any commitment to, to go beyond that at the moment. Do we know any more? I, I don't think we can say more than we say in the reports where we recognise that as one of the potential financial pressures facing colleges if that funding isn't available after 2020. These are programmes that are in youth employment and yeah. developing our workforce and so on, so presumably the colleges would wish to continue with these initiatives beyond that. I assume the colleges would and I assume government would, but there clearly is now, given the um, vote last June and the um, events that have unfolded since then, a need to review what happens if that European funding isn't available, how the objectives it's achieving could be met in other ways. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Liam Fair. I'll be brief, convener. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> two things I just want to explore. The first involving the SFC, if I may. Um, just looking at some of the other reports we've done, uh, in relation to Edinburgh College that we looked at earlier, the SFC removed credits from them, which plunged them into debt. Uh, they clawed back £800,000 on additionality. Uh, they're funding a voluntary severance scheme. Last week we looked at Murray College, uh, which is having financial challenges. Uh, and we also looked at Lewes Castle, uh, which has an allocation of credits, uh, which is causing a problem and doesn't get clawed back. So what's your view on how the SFC is managing the sector and indeed managing the public purse? Um, we have reported, as I said in my opening remarks, on the um, progress of college reform over the last three or four years. Um, and I think a couple of the clear messages coming out of that work have been, first of all, that it has been really an unprecedentedly complex range of reforms that were happening over that period. Um, and secondly, um, that the governance arrangements that have emerged from the end of it are now very complex, um, with uh, single college regional boards, um, college regions which are funding colleges in other parts of Scotland, um, and as you heard last week in UHI, a different set of arrangements before with seven colleges playing into UHI's overall objectives. Um, we have highlighted um, some of the changes that the Funding Council has tried to make to respond to the reform and the complexity that comes with it. We've also reported in some of the cases where that hasn't worked as well as it should have been, I think particularly in relation to um, the college in Lanarkshire that the committee spent some time on two years ago. Um, I think if you want to explore the future role of the Funding Council on the back of all the change that's um, been underway over that period, it would be appropriate to ask the Funding Council about it. I haven't drawn a conclusion about this other than to recognise the complexity and the areas where it hasn't gone as well as it might have done. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, the other level was uh, just exploring something Colin Beattie was talking about, uh, the staff uh, and staff costs. Uh, now there's been an awful lot of voluntary severance schemes, there have been a lot of voluntary severance schemes that we've looked at. In the same period, uh, so £18 million of costs that you say at Exhibit 10 uh, are related to staff severance. In the same period, staff costs have gone up by 24 million, which begs the question, what's going on with the workforce planning? Uh, are we removing too many people through the voluntary severance? Uh, and what's happening to those people that have come out of voluntary severance? Are they coming back into the sector? Uh, there's an awful lot in that question, um, and I need to start just by correcting, I think, the understanding of Exhibit 10. Um, exceptional staff costs, the figure of 18 million that you refer to, is the difference between what was incurred in 2012-13 and in 2015-16. Um, so, to forgive me, Auditor General, uh, paragraph 40, 18 million of which related to staff severance. Yep, you're absolutely right. Apologies for misunderstanding the question in that case. Um, Overall, um, I think what we have said over the last two or three years is that given the scale of reform that was going on, the range of mergers we've had of, of colleges, it was entirely understandable that voluntary severance schemes were needed to reshape the workforce, um, to take out things that were duplicated, both in terms of teaching and uh, support to, to teaching and learning, um, and also to reshape the workforce for new curriculums. Um, we have also said, though, that doing that in the absence of curriculum reviews and um, long-term 
workforce plans runs the risk of exactly what you're describing, um, of the wrong people being let go because they have other options and of people who um, may not be best matched with what the college is, is planning to do for the future remaining. We've reported the figures here because we have seen that uptick again in staff numbers for both teaching and non-teaching staff. Um, and we will continue through the audit work to look at the voluntary severance schemes that are in place. Um, but that's why we're particularly pleased to see the emphasis on workforce planning coming through in individual colleges and with support from the Funding Council to make sure there's a much longer term view in future of what staffing is needed and how it can be afforded against the backdrop of the financial pressures we've described. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and can I thank you for your evidence this morning? We'll now move into private session. Um, and uh, if I could ask that the public galleries are cleared.